to see it. I see it. This is the last set. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I'm the city council president. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city council dash TV. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence their phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd also like to ask if we all can be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you'll be asked to leave, and if you fail to comply, you'll be escorted out. Please also note that according to City Council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, can you please Call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum, please. Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Bach. Present. Councillor Braden. Here. Councillor Coletta. Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Flaherty. Yeah. Councillor Flynn. Here. Councillor Lara. Councillor Louis Jen. Councillor Mejia. Councillor Murphy. Here. And Councillor Worrell. Here. Thank you. I have been informed by the clerk that there is a quorum present. This week's clergy is Reverend Kevin Peterson, invited by City Councilor Michael Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, would you like to come to the podium and introduce our clergy for today? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have the privilege and honor of uh, introducing a friend, a longtime friend. We've known each other over 25 years, and that's Reverend Kevin Peterson the founder of the New Democracy Coalition and the Faneuil Hall Race and Reconciliation Project. He is a minister based at the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Dorchester, senior fellow at the Center for Collaborative Leadership at UMass Boston, master's degree of arts and urban ministry at the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, honorary doctorate of Maine Letters from Wayland Baptist Theological Seminary. As a journalist, he's also published numerous articles and editorials about race, culture, and politics. Most of note, he recently received the Martin Luther King Jr. Award at the Elliott Church in Roxbury. Someone that I know and appreciate and respect. Uh, we don't always bat a thousand. Uh, we don't always agree. We agree more than we disagree. Uh, but the spirit uh, of that and also um, the friendship that has come from that. He knows that despite some of our disagreements, if he needs anything, I'm probably one of the first guy over the boards and same if I need something, he's one of the first that I call. So I call him a true friend cares deeply about our city, moving our city forward, and having Boston be the best city of Boston can be. Without further ado, uh, my guest today, Reverend Kevin Peterson, to deliver today's invocation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. And thank you, uh, President uh, Flynn, for this, uh, this hosting. Much appreciated. I ask, in, in my tradition, I ask that all stand uh, as we breathe a word of prayer. Good morning. Good morning. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far along the way, thou who has by thy might let us in the light, keep us forever in the path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the place, our God, where we met thee, lest our heart drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee, shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God and true to our native land. Good Lord, on this day in this house of civic vitality where your servants meet weekly. We recognize your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and your love and your grace. You have truly blessed us. You have blessed us one by one and name by name. And these here, your public servants, have been blessed with the gifts and opportunities of leadership. 
They are fighting, Lord, every day against the odds, fighting on behalf of those who Jesus called the least of these. They are striving on the behalf of those whose backs are against the wall in life, struggling in pain. So, Lord, we thank you because you have blessed our families, our loved ones, our kith and our kin. You have blessed our communities. You have blessed Boston and have embraced our righteous endeavors. And so, Lord, we say thank you. Still, some of us are confused and distraught this afternoon. Despair, disalignment, disorientation dot the canvas of our spiritual skies. But joy comes in the morning. Some of us today face fear, our fraughtness, our fragility, our feebleness, our finitude shape the features of our days, and we ask, what is this thing called life? What problems, what multiple vexations people our days, but joy comes in the morning. And in the storms of life, in the wintered bounds, shape-shifting, tempestuous throes of our daily existence, we wonder where do we turn to, where do we go, but joy comes in the morning. And so we call out for help against the wild winds of street violence right now. Give us your wisdom today, O oh Lord. We call out for help against paralyzing poverty and the punishing details replete with thriving in our city. Give us your knowledge and empathy today, O oh Lord. We call out for help against the reign of racism and the ugly forms of xenophobia, of hate, of distrust. Give us your awareness today, O oh Lord. And make us turn towards each other and not against each other, knowing that love is the question and love is the answer, and that we must ever choose the power of love over the love of power. We must ever choose the power of love over the love of power. Give us your love today, Lord. We call on you for help. We call on you to help us across the broad streets, the byways, the boulevards that characterize the neighborhoods and communities across the city from Mass and Cass to Manapan Square, from Eastie to Westie, from the North End to the South End, from the Seaport Center to Center Street. Be with us in every way. Protect us, Lord. Protect us with your love. And now, oh, great God, this afternoon we ask for your strength and your wisdom. For the leaders gathered here today with their heads bowed, they seek a word from you. No, oh, Lord, is there a word from you? Yes, there is a word. That word is justice. Keep these men and women of the Boston City Council humble and hardworking. Keep these women and men dedicated not to themselves, but to the most desperate and the most vulnerable in our city. Keep these women and men open to the hope that their efforts can be translated into the exigencies of good policy. Keep these women and men ever aware that they are at their best conductors of our best and collective intentions. And bless our mayor and bless our commissioner of police, and bless our superintendent of schools. And as you do this, Lord, we will be grateful. And we will be grateful when the day in this city of Boston comes to a place where we'll all be Boston strong, we'll all be flourishing in your goodwill and in your glory, and we will all stand on this shining city of hill, on the hill and say hallelujah, 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 amen. Thank you.
So I would, um, if you don't mind, would like to say a few words, uh, Councillor Flaherty and President Flynn and members of, of the council about uh, where I believe we stand, even as we come to the final session of the year. You know, it doesn't have to be said, but it should be said that you members of the Boston City Council, you may, you may be seated, you members of the Boston City Council represent the good and the proud, the good and the proud beating heart of this city. And this is excellent. And beloved counselors, you represent the pulse and the veins and the, the muscles and the sinew and the very consciousness of our local body, body politics. And this, and this is good and it's excellent. And you mirror now the diversity and the complexity and the majesty of the, of the city that is not like any other city. And this is good and this is excellent. Indeed, the nation looks to Boston as an example for patterns of government, good example, for civic wisdom, for styles and ingenuity of political comportment. The nation looks to Boston for good example. You know this, I know this. We all know how great Boston is and how great this city council is, even in its present composure. But it has not been lost upon some of us in the public that despite the grandeur and the glorious past of this body, Despite the intelligence clearly represented here by your presence, counselors, and despite your best intentions and your deep caring, we as a city and through proxy through the city council find ourselves at an impasse at yet being even better. Now, no one is perfect. We all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. No one, nobody is perfect. But the great question of life always is, might we be better? It's not that we might be better men or be better women, not better husbands or wives, not just as better neighbors or good neighbors, but specifically today I'm talking about being better city councilors. The question is, might we, we be better? Might we perhaps learn to reframe from our baser inclinations to manipulate and prevaricate and spin the truth and pose for the purposes of electoral advantage? Might we perhaps be wiser in taming what might be called the naughtier proclivities that focus on pure calculation and precinct advantage and votes? Might we be better? Now, no one is perfect. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but again, in all sobriety and with all the love I can muster in my heart, I ask, might we be better? And we preachers struggle with this every day and every hour. We preachers try to be better, and we struggle with it every hour of every day. We leaders who just try to be a little better. And as I come to my, the closing of my remarks, I, I just want to encourage you. 
based on what we in the public has seen this year, we ask you out of a deep love in our heart to be better, be a little kinder to each other, be a little more careful to each other, be a little more conscientious about each other. And if we do that, we'll find ourselves making the, the type of city, the beloved city, that Dr. King has referenced so much during his life. I'm so proud to be part of this city. I'm so proud to be connected to this body through friendships and deep affiliations. But I ask that we just be better. Now, in my few seconds, I just want to say that um, the issue of reparations will be raised today. And I'm deeply concerned about this issue because my organization has been connected to this matter from the outset. And we've tried to connect reparations to Faneuil Hall. And it's all in the efforts of trying to be better. So I ask you to um, just give me. I, I'm just concluding. So I ask you. I, 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 so I just ask you, as I conclude, to be supportive of of this bill uh, as we try to be a better city. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it. Thank you. Can you please join me in the pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clerk, can you please let the record be reflected that Councilor Arroyo is present, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Lara, Councilor Louis Jean. Okay. I would also like to recognize in the audience, audience former city councilor Garrett Saunders for being here. <laughs> approval of the minutes. <clears throat> We're on to the first order of business, which is the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The, meeting, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from her honor the mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1520, please? Docket number 1520, message in order for your approval, an ordinance establishing the Office of Participatory Budgeting, amending the City of Boston Code, Chapter 5, with the insertion of a new section, 5-1.11. Thank you. Docket. 1520 will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, can you please let the record be reflected that Council Mejia is here? Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1521, please? Docket number 1521, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant from the Boston Planning and Development Agency in an amount not to exceed $4,785,000 for costs related to the pedestrian improvement projects on Canal Street and Thoreau Path and the bike lane connection projects between Causeway Street and Commercial Street. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Baker, the Chair of the Committee on Planning, <coughs> Development, Transportation. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this, this grant is mitigation money that comes through the BPDA from development that happened over in the Garden and Canal Street. But uh, it, it, um, the cost is, 
This is a grant from the Boston Planning and Development Agency for costs related to the pedestrian improvement projects on Canal Street and Thoreau Path, as well as bike lane connection projects between Causeway Street and Commercial Street. I've received emails from the West End residents supporting this fun funding, and due to the, abund to the abundant amount of construction that's occurred over the, over the years, Thoreau Path has been damaged, and funding will help make this safe a safer walking path for residents. This was part of a of a um, another package that included Northern Ave. We separated them out. We, we vetted this, so um, I'd like to suspend and pass this here today, Mr. President. Councilor Baker seeks suspension of the rules and passive docket one five two one. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Docket one five two one has passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket one five two two? Document number 1522, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $567,000 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 23 state information system improvements awarded by the United States Department of Transportation, passed through the Mass Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund specialized equipment for 564 marked and unmarked cruisers to implement the motor vehicle automated citation and crash system in Boston. The e-citation technology issues electronic traffic citations which can be printed out in the police cruisers. Thank you. The docket 1522 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1523? Docket number 1523, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $90,000 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 22 composting and food waste reduction pilot projects awarded by the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation to be administered by the Public Works Department. The grant will fund the planning process for a permitted site in the City of Boston with the capacity to accept food scraps, and soiled paper. Before I assign it, um, I know Council Block, did you want to speak on this? Uh, yes, Mr. President, I was um, hoping to seek suspension of passage. I thought since it was public works, it would be under, but um, I can speak to it. I, I just would say this is a, it's an exciting grant from the federal government. I think folks know that we've got a composting pilot right now going for 10,000 families in the city of Boston, with the goal being to grow that to um, 20 and then 30 and beyond. The trick is that we are actually, even just with our 10,000, basically taking up the compost processing capacity of the region right now. Um, and so for Boston to really expand this program to be a universal thing, we need to um, create more of that capacity to process food waste. Um, it's also an important piece of the puzzle with uh, getting food waste into a separate stream and helping with our rat problem that we've all been discussing. Um, so. Uh, as the council knows, we put some money in the American Rescue Plan budget for creating permanent composting um, and um, uh, digester facilities in the city of Boston. Um, but we're really excited that to supplement that, this grant has come in from the federal government, not least because um, we think that starting to partner with the USDA around the issue could help us get further federal support in the future since really building out this full capacity for the city um, could, could be quite a sizable undertaking. So it would be fantastic if so that Public Works could start working with that money, we could suspend and pass it before the uh, end of the um, legislative year. Thank, Thank you, Council Bach. Council Bach, Council Bach uh, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology, seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1523. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Docket 1523 has passed. Mr. Clark, can you please read docket 1524? Docket number 1524, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $10,000 <coughs> in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 National Violence Death Reporting System <coughs> awarded by the Mass Department of Public Health to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund data collection by the Bureau of Investigation Services and the Drug Control Unit. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Flaherty, the Chair of Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, move for uh, suspension and passage today, uh, $10,000 in to help foster the spirit of cooperation between the Public Health Commission and the Boston Police Department, particularly as it pertains to 
uh, what we've been dealing with over the Massacassi area. This grant would fund data collection by the Bureau of Investigative Services and the Drug Control Unit. And at this time, this chair moved for suspension passage. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Council Flaherty. The chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice, seeks suspension of the rules passage of Docket 1524. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Docket 1524 is passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read Docket 1525, please? Docket number 1525, message in order for the withdrawal of docket number 0927. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expand a grant from the Boston Planning and Development Agency in the amount not to exceed $6,785,000 for the costs related to the pedestrian improvement projects on Canal Street and Thoreau Path and the bike lane connection projects between Causeway Street and Commercial Street and the planning, design, and or reconstruction of the Northern Avenue Bridge. Thank you. Docket 1927 is with Braun, but docket 1525 will be placed on file. Reports of public officers and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 1526 to 1528 together. Docket number 1526, notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of November 2nd, 2022. Docket number 1527. Notice was received from the city clerk in accordance of chapter six of the ordinances of 1979. Relative to action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of November 30th, 2022. And docket number 1528. Notice was received from the city clerk in accordance with chapter six of the ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the mayor on papers acted upon by the city council at its meeting of December 7th, 2022. Thank you. Those dockets 1526 <coughs> through 1528 will be placed on file. Reports of committees. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 0239? Docket number 0239, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on February 2nd, 2022. Docket number 0239, an ordinance creating a commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans, submits a report recommending that the ordinance ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council of Royal, the, <coughs> the Chair on the Committee on Government Operations. Council of Royal, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the Committee on Government Operations held a hearing on March 28, 2022 in a working session on November 3, 2022, and I'd like to thank Councillor Julia Mejia, Councillor Tanya Fernandez anderson and Councillor Brian Worrell for sponsoring this matter, as well as my council colleagues for attending, Council President Ed Flynn, Councillor Ruth, uh, Councillor Ruth Louis Jen, uh, Councillor Kenzie Bach, Councillor Liz Braden, Councillor Kendra Lara, and Councillor Aaron Murphy. And I'd also like to thank members of this administration, Mary Angeli Solis Cervera, Chief of Equity and Inclusion, Lori Nelson, uh, Senior Advisor for Racial Justice in the Cabinet for Equity and Inclusion. Uh, and the committee was also joined by ad advocates, Dr. Jimadari uh, Kamara, Director of the Center of African Caribbean and Community Development, uh, Yvette Modestine, Commissioner of the National African American Reparation Commission, and Dr. Raymond Winbush, uh, Director of the Institute for Urban Research at Morgan State University. And I'd like to thank them for their attendance and participation at these hearings as well. Uh, this docket is an amended draft uh, from, an, from the original, uh, and I want to get into some of those changes. Uh, one of those changes was to put in clearly delineated phases. Uh, this task force now has three clearly delineated phases of work it will do. Uh, phase one being research and document the city of Boston's role in and historical ties to the African slave trade and the institution and legacies of slavery. Phase two, uh, will make final, uh, sorry, phase two will actually uh, assess the city of Boston's actions to date to address continued impact, uh, impacts of enslavement. And phase three will make final recommendations to the city of Boston for truth, reconciliation, and reparations, addressing the city of Boston's involvement with the African slave trade. Uh, and to answer some of the things uh, that have come up, uh, one of the requests uh, that we had received uh, both in hearings uh, and through uh, outreach, is a uh, hope uh, in a request that we make it clear and delineated within the language that the large majority of this board uh, would be African-American, black, 
slave freedmen in this uh, group. And because of the language regarding the creation of task force and commissions that we have on the legality of sort of race neutrality, what we did to try and address that is made clear within the membership that the language we use here is that uh, the mayor shall appoint no fewer than five members uh, who have a connection to the descendants of formerly enslaved black people in the United States. And the hope is that that language makes clear that the intent for the makers, uh, and I think the intent for uh, getting to a place that we want to be, uh, and I want to be clear about this too, this is not conclusionary. Uh, I fully support reparations. Uh, when those <coughs> recommendations come forward, I will fully support and push what those recommendations are. But the goal for this task force is to define, not limit, the amount or severity of the harm that we are able to find documented within uh, both the time of chattel slavery, but also in the aftermath of that chattel slavery and policies directly created and run by this city uh, that have impacted people of color, specifically African American black people, on the basis of uh, the after effects and after impacts of the racial caste system that was created in this country. Uh, and so the objective of this task force is to both analyze and, and, and measure the severity of that harm, uh, and then to analyze and measure what the severity of the cure for that harm should be. Uh, and it is to do that work uh, as an independent body, which is written out in this document, uh, on a firmly prescribed timeline uh, that does give the, the task force itself the ability to extend with a letter to the mayor if they feel that they are not going to reach one of these deadlines. All of this is clearly delineated to take no longer than two years maximum to get to where we want to get to on uh, actual proposals to the city for reparation uh, or, or reparations for the harm uh, that this city uh, is responsible for. Uh, and in no way should this limit, in my opinion, actions by this council itself to continue to advocate for the alleviation of those harms in other measures and in other ordinances and hearings. Uh, I think that as they do their work, we should continue to do ours. Uh, and I want to just note uh, that passage of this docket is a culmination of the work, sacrifice, and vision of those who began that work, and namely, I want to name Senator Bill Owens, who began the conversation around implementing reparations in Massachusetts in 1988, uh, some 34 years ago. Uh, and so we know the ability to enact this legislation at the municipal level has a direct impact on racial equity and reconciliation of black Bostonians. And today, Boston has the opportunity to join a growing group of cities across the nation in establishing a task force on reparations to forge the pathways towards justice and healing. There's a need for the city of Boston to reconcile its history with slavery and its consequences, resulting in systemic racism and discrimination. And I believe that this is a strong first step getting there uh, and ensuring that we have a productive, fully task, uh, fully, uh, fully functioning task force that has the ability to independently do this work while still having the resources of this city to get that work done. Uh, and so I look forward to uh, recommending that this passage, that this pass, I look forward to seeing this task force take shape. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the results of this work uh, reverberate through the city and its impact, uh, similar to, in my hope, is the reverberations of the harm and the generational reverberations of that harm, that the cure and that the work that we are doing reverberates similarly for generations to come. And so uh, I'm excited to put this on the floor. Uh, this was a process that took a lot of back and forth with the administration, with community, with the sponsors. Uh, and I think we've gotten to a place where the product will be strong. And it is my hope that uh, folks give this process a chance that as we move towards appointing and, and doing that, which uh, are powers that lie with the mayor, uh, because this is something that comes from the council through charter, uh, the mayor has the ability to make these appointments, but is clearly uh, the wish of myself and the sponsors that those who are put on this have a direct connection to the descendants of slavery in the United States and that they lead that conversation as they should. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I recommend that this docket ought to pass in a new draft. Uh, and I thank the sponsors again for their work over the last two years. And I thank those who have come before us, like Senator Bill Owens, who have stood up and had these conversations when it was a much more difficult climate, frankly, to have them in. Uh, and so I'm grateful to them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Arroyo. I'm going to um, give an opportunity for the sponsors to um, provide comments for three minutes if, the, if they would like. Uh, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez-Anderson. Councilor Fernandez-Anderson, you have the floor. 
Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, ri I rise proudly as a co-sponsor in favor of the creation of the Reparations Task Force in the City of Boston. Um, earlier in the year, the Council agreed to apologize for the role that the City played in the transatlantic slave trade. This was a powerful moment, and I am proud that the Council voted the way that we did. But as powerful as that was, it exists in the realm of the words. As, as profound as it is, it doesn't cost anyone a penny. Jargon is well and good, as we all know. It has meaning, but it doesn't put food on anyone's table or pay anyone's rent or put roof on anyone's head, over anyone's head. So here we are. This is the next step. The Reparations Task Force can begin the process of taking us from words to action. No one entity, including the mayor, uh, should exercise a dominant influence over it in terms of uh, Appointments, I, uh, sure, um, but specifically, it should belong to the people. The task force needs to represent various elements, including community organizations and civic leaders that represent the masses of Bostonians, and of course, all based in best practices. You know that we are a rich city and one of the richest in the country. We have hospitals, universities, and museums that are worth millions and millions of dollars and that have grown rich from the labor of black people, both paid and unpaid. They need to be part of this process. And truly reparative process will call from the resources that these institutions have. And if you, have, if you are wondering if such task force is needed, I ask you to think of the chattel slavery that existed in this city. I ask you to remember decades of legalized segregation I remind you of the redlining that limited where, where black people in our city could live. I humbly ask that you recall the education that black children have received in Boston has been described as death to an early age. I ask that you think of the fact that while we have some of the greatest hospitals in the world, the healthcare experiences of the masses of black people have been described as medical apartheid. I submit that predominantly black Roxbury has the highest percentage of people making less than 15,000 per year and the lowest percentage of people making more than $150,000 per year in the city. I am called upon to mention that the average life expectancy predominantly black and working class Roxbury is 30 years less than the wealthier and the wider back bay merely a mile away. And yes, it's an oft quoted stat, but it reminds true that the average black family in Boston has a net worth of just eight bucks. Some will argue that statistic, quite sure it's not far behind, compared to a nearly a quarter million for an average white family. So yes, we need reparations for black people in Boston for people directly connected to these harms. And before we can get the reparations, we need a reparations task force is necessary. Therefore, I humbly but forcibly request that you vote in favor of the reparations task force in our city. I thank you for listening. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. That's right. Give it up. Um, yes, uh, so just wanted to just really quickly uh, just rise in gratitude and uh, to, to thank Senator Owens for having the insight and political courage to lead us in the space where we are today. And to Dr. Kamara for leaning in and working alongside our office and Yvette Modestine and Tanisha Sullivan from the NAACP who first introduced this concept to our office and invited us to participate with such audacity. Um, and, and so for your leadership and helping us get to this place, thank you. I also want to thank um, King Boston, NDC, and the countless other community advocates 
and organizers who have been sounding the alarm for repair and harm here in the city of Boston. I want to thank my co-sponsors for standing up and fighting alongside us to get to this place. Thank you. And to the administration, y'all know I'm not easy to deal with. But when I like to fight, I dig my heels in because I know when you fight the good fight, we all win. So I just want to thank the administration for going back and forth with us so that we can land in a place that was going to affirm the people that we are fighting for. So thank you to Mayor Wu for having the political courage to step into that power and create space for that to happen. And lastly, I want to thank my colleagues for embarking on this journey with us and to Councillor Bach in particular who when we first introduced this hearing order, when it wasn't the advantageous thing to do, did so and stood alongside us. So thank you, Councillor Bach, um, for joining us on this journey as well. And Councillor Louis Jen, who held it down during the working sessions and really helped us understand and define language that was going to pass legal muster in the early stages. So I just want to say thank you for standing alongside us. Um, and thank you. It's just really all about thank you. Because what this moment needs is for us to recognize <clears throat> not just the harm, but the opportunity that we have to heal. And the only way we're going to heal is if we are seen, validated, and heard and acknowledging it. So I hope as this task force is created that we do so with the best intentions and rooted in what this moment calls for, is for us to have the political courage and will to finally right the wrong. So thank you to all of those who joined us and I hope that my colleagues will um, recognize that this is just the beginning of the conversation, not the conclusion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Orell. Council Orell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to my co-sponsors, Council Mejia. Thank you for giving all those thank yous that really heartfelt. Um, and thank you to Council Anderson, my other co-sponsor. Uh, also like to thank all the advocates uh, that we see here who are continuously fighting for equity and corrective action here in the city of Boston, uh, Dr. Kamara, uh, Mr. Winbush, Ms. Modestine, Reverend Kevin Peterson, uh, King Boston, NDC, NAACP, Embrace Boston. Uh, thank you for all your work in advancing equity. I also want to acknowledge, um, as we've heard, the shoulders that we all stand on um, and pay homage to our Senator uh, Owens, um, aka the Godfather. Um, I stand in support of this monumental and long overdue ordinance that will start the process of dismantling systemic oppression and putting in place old investments to forever change the direct trajectory of black people here in Boston. Uh, for hundreds of years, in a variety of different forms, systemic oppression has taken shape in every area of public policy, slavery, Jim Crow laws, busing, urban renewal, redlining, and block busting. Um, it's reflected, um, we've seen this play out in the budget uh, from every report in every department here in the city of Boston. Um, and this is not news to anyone here in this room or in the, on this council. Um, and generations have sacrificed and fought for a future free of systemic oppression. Um, and it's past time that our government acts to mitigate past harms and prevent future policies rooted in these, in, rooted in these inequities. Uh, reparation, in, in my mind, it just is not a one-time payment. It's not just about our capital budget allocations or funding the programs, but it's a more holistic approach to right past wrongs and ensure a brighter future for generations of black Bostonians. Um, it's institutional change that is rooted in data, corrective action, intentionality, and urgency. Uh, we often hear about Boston's role in making, making of U.S. history, and as a black man and a lifelong Bostonian who has seen this, these disparities play out every day, it is my dream to help our city fulfill the promises of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all, and to fulfill this promise of our city and country to every resident. So I'm hoping that everyone on this council um, votes in favor of this initiative and single to the rest, rest of the country that Boston will continue to fight for racial equity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilor Worrell. The Chair recognizes Councilor Louis-Jean. Councilor Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, and I don't want to take up much time. I just want to say thank you to the sponsors, and I also want to echo the thanks to Senator Bill Owens, um, who really <coughs> spearheaded this conversation here um, decades ago, and to acknowledge the many people who have been working towards reparations, just both here in the city and across the country. Um, as a city councilor, I'm proud of our city for coming to this point. Um, as Councilor Mejia noted, I had the privilege of working with uh, you, uh, Yvette Modestine, Modestine um, um, uh, with Dr. Kamara, um, with uh, Dr. Winbush, and really thinking about what repair um, looks like as a black woman, as, as someone who comes from Haiti, the first uh, country to really uh, throw off the yoke of slavery and the only country to be founded off of a state of slave revolt that really inspired many. We know that the continued harm that, that chattel slavery has had on so many of our communities. And here, I'm excited for us to really center the voices of those who have been directly impacted um, as a result of chattel slavery here in the city of Boston. This is, an, uh, this is an opportunity for us to examine the harm caused and to repair through dialogue, truth, reconciliation, compassion, and most importantly, material repair. Um, and so I'm excited for this moment for our city and for what this can mean. This is really historic um, and a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to really begin to examine what that um, repair really could look like. And so uh, my colleagues have already stated uh, with, with significant depth um, the work of this task force and what they will do. And I, I continue uh, to be hopeful about what we can achieve and, and look forward to working alongside you, the New Democracy Coalition, and all of those who have really led the fight here. So I just want to say um, I'm hoping that this will pass. And my congratulations to all of you for the work involved here. This is just the beginning. And I look forward to continuing working alongside all of you. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. And at the risk of sounding repetitive, I just want to echo all of the sentiments um, that my colleagues share here on the floor. This is an in incredibly past time for us to be doing this work, but nonetheless, we welcome it at whatever speed um, it is happening. I think that um, there was a lot, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that were put into making this happen, not just for the city of Boston, but for all of the countless cities across the country who have also taken on this work. And so again, although we are not leaders, I'm really excited to say that the city of Boston is gonna take this on. I have every intention of voting to support it, and I hope that my council colleagues would do the same. Thank you, President. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. I'll be very brief. Um, I just, I do want to thank all of the folks who have worked for so many years, so many decades on this front, um, and uh, give a particular shout out to Councillor Mejia, just because when we did uh, introduce that hearing order together, it was for a conversation, um, and I think it's so important. This absolutely has to be a conversation, but it needs to be a process that um, yields real things, and uh, and we need to have the folks who are the descendants of slave at the heart of it. Um, and that meant coming up with a process that would get it off the council floor and like into that really robust, well-supported community conversation. And so um, I, I'm really glad that this went from being just a hearing order to, um, to this filing today, and we'll be pleased to support it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, thank you, Council Bob. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker. Thank you, you Mr. The President. Um, I will be voting in favor of the um, of the task force here today, but just a couple stats. In 1783, and this comes from an op-ed in the Bay State Banner, 1783, the, the state of Massachusetts made slavery illegal. The city of Boston was not incorporated until 1822, and the 1790 uh, census had no slaves living in Massachusetts. So just a couple points, I will, be, I will be voting in favor of the task force, so if it provides healing for communities, and that's what I'm about. Thank you. Thank you, Council Baker. Council Arroyo seeks acceptance of the committee report in passage of docket 0239 in a new draft. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Mr. Clerk, can you do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 0239. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach? Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden? Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta? Yes. 
Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Lara, yes. Councilor Louis Jen. Yes. Councilor Louis Jen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. And Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Docket number 0239 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Park. Can you please read docket 1516 to 1519 together, please? Docket number 1516, the Committee on Sur City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on December 7, 2022. Docket number 1516, message in order for your approval, in order re to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $2,072,216 to provide funding for various departments for the fiscal year 23 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and SEIU Local 888 Citywide. Submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. Docket number 1517. The Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on December 7, 2022. Docket number 1517. Message in order for the supplemental appropriation order for various departments for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $2,072,216 to cover the fiscal year 23 cost items contained within the collect collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and SEIU Local 888 Citywide submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Docket number 1518, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on December 7, 2022. Docket number 1518, message in order for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by 360000 $360 to provide funding for various departments for fiscal year 23. Increases contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Boston and SEIU Local 888, Mayor's Office of Housing, submits a report recommending the order ought to pass. In Doc number 1519, the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology, to which was referred on December 7, 2022, Doc number 1519. Message in order for the supplemental appropriation for various departments for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $360,360 to provide to cover for the fiscal year 23 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and SEIU Local 888 Mayor's Office of Housing. Submits a report recommending that the order ought to pass. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Block, the Chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Councilor Block, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and uh, this matter was actually referred to committee last Wednesday, and I want to give a special thanks to the clerk's um, staff and the central staff who managed to get a notice out for us minutes after it was accepted to the committee on the floor so that we could have a hearing on it um, on Friday. Um, and uh, that was important because um, this represents the settling of contracts for almost 5% of the city's workforce. I think it's 870 employees across the two contracts, SEIU 888 citywide across 20 odd departments, and then the Mayor's Office of Housing Division specifically, which bargains separately. Um, it is a sort of continuation of the pattern contract that we've seen. Um, so the pattern is it's a 2%, 1.5%, 2%. Increases over three years. These, as councillors will remember, are contracts that actually go back to 2020. Um, so most of these contracts uh, will actually start to lapse again in 2023. Um, and one of the things that um, the councillors uh, who joined me at the hearing, President Flynn and Councillor Murphy, um, and I all stressed was the hope that, especially in this context of rampant inflation and a really hard cost of living for our city workers, that as the city looks to kind of the next round of contracts. Well, there are, there are reasons for, the, for us to sort of complete the pattern, to be fair, across all city workers, that now as we get to the next round of contracts, that we're able to do more substantial increases um, paired with more substantive reforms, because I think we all see that those numbers in, in light of the current inflation are a bit low. 
Um, uh, it, these folks will also get the one-time lump sum $1,000 um, that have been going to a lot of the civilian um, union workers in recognition of their work during COVID-19. There's an adjustment to the way that the city supports, the amount the city supports, MBTA passes, and the free blue bikes membership, um, all in the employee's favor. Um, Juneteenth is formally added to the contract. Um, there was uh, just some language fixes around including veteran status, gender, gender identity, gender expression, and ethnicity in the non-discrimination article of the contract. A couple of wellness days in the next couple of years um, that are additional for folks. Um, and then this recognition that SEAU MOH is a separate unit for collective bargaining. Um, so continuation of the um, pattern and obviously, uh, as folks know, this council vote is required in order for people to get their retroactive pay going back to 2020. So the reason that we rushed it through was that you know we would really like finance to be able to be getting people those checks and um, having it come as a as a nice um, thing for the holidays. So in recognition of that, Mr. President, I would ask that all four of these um, dockets uh, be approved today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Block. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1516. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Docket 1516 is passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the community report and passage of docket 1517. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Docket 1517 is passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report, passage of docket 1518. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Docket 1518 has passed. Council Block seeks acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1519. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Docket 1519 has passed. Before we move on to the <coughs> matters recently heard for possible action, I, I wanted to acknowledge the City of Boston Municipal Security Officers, um, the incredible role they play. It's the most diverse city union um, in, in, in Boston. Um, they're also up for um, contract negotiation and they're probably one of the lowest paid unions as well. So it's important that we treat all of our city workers with respect, but these city workers also, again, the most diverse union in the city of Boston, our security municipal police staff, security staff, um, deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, can, we, can you please read docket 0323? Docket number 0323, order for a hearing to discuss restoring municipal voting rights to immigrants with legal status. Thank you. <clears throat> the chair recognizes Council Louis Jean, the chair of the Committee on Civil Rights, Immigration Advancement. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. On Monday, December 12th, the Committee on Civil Rights and Immigrant Advancement held a hearing on docket number 0323, order for a hearing to discuss restoring municipal voting rights to immigrants with legal status. The committee held a hearing with the sponsor, Councilor Lada, and Councilors Flynn, Murphy, Coletta, Mejia, Worrell, Arroyo, Fernandez Anderson, uh, who were all in attendance, and a letter of absence from Councilor Bach. Thank you to the administration, specifically to uh, the director of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement, Monique Tu Nguyen, uh, Sabino Pomonte, the head assistant registrar of the Elections Department, Elijah Miller, director of policy for, department, uh, for the Department of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, and thank you to the panelists, Alex Kazar, uh, the Matthew W. Sterling, Junior Professor of History and Social Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, Shanique Spaulding, the Mas uh, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Voter Table, and Jacob Love, Staff Attorney from the Lawyers for Civil Rights. And thank you to, uh, to public testimony from Trepetta Simmons, who uh, wrote in comments regarding returning citizens' voting rights. Um, Information gathered at the hearing, the administration panel, specifically Moya Director Nguyen, spoke about the work of Moya in promoting and recognizing the contributions of immigrants to our city and how they would be integral in ensuring that our immigrants with legal status would know of their voting rights because of the deep partnerships Moya has with community organizations who have already been doing this work of organizing immigrant communities around um, voting rights. Uh, Elijah Miller, the Director of Policy for, Department, for the Department of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, spoke passionately about strengthening the ability of immigrants to fully and equitably participate in economic, civic, social, and cultural life in Boston, and how this would be a step towards doing that. And Sabino Pomonte, Head Assistant Registrar of Elections, spoke about what his office would need in terms of resources for implementation, and brought up matters the City Council should consider when thinking about restoring non-citizen voting rights. 
The advocate panel, specifically Jacob Love, staff attorney for lawyers for civil rights, discussed with, com uh, the, with the committee the legal barriers and challenges in implementing of voting rights for non-citizens, but also talked about how other states and um, cities have approached the issue of restoring municipal voting rights to um, immigrants with legal status. Professor Kayser from the Harvey Kennedy School um, in, uh, informed the committee about the history of voting by non-citizens and its relative compliance among states in the, in the 19th and early 20th century, including non-citizen voting in some federal elections up until 1996. So this is not a foreign idea by any means. The committee also heard testimony from Shanique Spaulding of the Mass Voters Table on issues including uh, the work that they do with community groups on advocacy around restoring municipal voting rights and doing simulations with um, immigrant groups and members about what it would be like to vote in the process of actually voting. Overall, the committee discussed how legal voting rights for non-citizens would be a significant boon to our communities uh, who are already taxpaying members who participate in our civic life. Uh, the committee discussed what the best processes for passing a non-citizen voting rights uh, bill would be and what the challenges would be for implementation. Um, we on this body every day, um, not every day, but very often set legislative ordinance um, and non-citizens have no ability to elect us um, in making those laws. That exclusion is a fundamental deprivation of immigrants um, with legal status from our process and their own right to self-determination. We on this body have the ability to correct for that and we should, um, that is the work of equity. This hearing order will remain in committee for further action, thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Louis Jean. Docket 0323 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, can you please read dockets <coughs> 1171 through 1173, 1176 through 1179, and 1212, please? Docket number 1171, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Sherry Dong as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2023. Docket number 1172, message in order for the confirmation of the reappointment of Hansi Better Barraza as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2024. One, one, docket number 1173, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Giovanni Valencia as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2024. Docket number 1176, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Alan E. Langham as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2025. Docket number 1177, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Norm Stembridge as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2025. Docket number 1178, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Chevelle Oliver as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2025. Docket number 1179, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of David Collins as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2025. And docket number 1212, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Katie uh, Wellwell as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeal for a term expiring May 1st, 2024. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes council. <coughs> the chair recognizes Council of Baker, the chair of the committee on planning, development, and transportation. Council of Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. These matters were sponsored by the mayor and referred to the committees on <coughs> planning, development, and transportation. Dockets one one seven one 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 seven two one one seven three and one one seven six one one seven seven and one one seven nine on September twenty eighth. 2022 and docket 1212 on October 5th, 2022. The committee held a public hearing in the Inela. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, I'm going to speak on all these and we'll, we'll, we'll vote separately on them. I assume they should have said that from the beginning. That, Just kind of speak on all of them broadly and you can break them up. Yeah, that's fine, Council. Okay, Baker. thank you. Thank you. Uh, the committee held a public hearing in the Ionella Chamber on December 12th, 2022 to take testimony and consider the same. I was joined by my colleagues, Council Murphy, President Flynn, Council Lujan, Council Coletta, Council Worrell, and Council Bach. Uh, in attendance, Chris English, Chief of Staff at Inspectional Service Department, attended the hearing and presented testimony on, on the mission, composition, and jurisdiction of the Zoning Board, Board of Appeal, and in support of all the appointments and reappointments. 
The, the ZBA totals 14 members, seven primary and seven alternate members with the range of experience required by state law. Uh, and they serve three-year terms. Al alternate serve if primary members are unable to attend ZBA hearings and the members are appointed by the mayor and approved by the city, by the city council. The ZBA is tasked with reviewing de development proposals in the city of Boston. They hear requests regarding zoning issues such as conditional use permits, variances, permission to expand or changes to or change approved uses and similar zoning relief. The City Council's Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation reviewed the resumes and credentials of all the appointees, and the appointees responded to questions from the Chair and other councils regarding their qualifications, relevant experience, background area of expertise, how they would handle conflict of interest situations, and on the independence, rationale, and criteria that they would exercise when making decisions. Based on the testimony and information presented at the hearing and having considered the same, I respectfully, I respectfully report that these appointments and reappointments ought to be confirmed. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Baker. Council Baker seeks acceptance of the committee acceptance of the committee report and confirmation of Sherry Dong as a member of Zoning Board of Appeals, which is docket 1171. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report and confirmation of docket 1172. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council of Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report and confirmation of um, docket 1173. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report, confirmation of docket 1176. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report in confirmation of docket 1177. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Baker seeks accept acceptance of the committee report, confirmation of docket 1178. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report and confirmation of docket 1179. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Council Baker seeks acceptance of the committee report. Confirmation of docket 1212. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The appointment has been confirmed. Mr. Clerk, can you read 1327, please? Docket number 1327, order for a hearing assessing the need for a tax amendment for the Boston Zoning Code relative to special protection zones. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Alara, the Chair of the Committee on Housing Community Development. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, we held a hearing on the need for a text amendment to the Boston Zoning Code regarding specifically Article 91, who has, that has been in uh, draft form for several years now. In this hearing, we specifically explored the idea of transit-oriented displacement zone overlay um, in the city's code. I, let me see, excuse me, let me pull up my notes so I can thank the proper people. Um, I was joined yesterday by my council colleagues and Councillor Gabriela Caleta, who was my co-sponsor, Councillor Braden, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Bach. Councilor Lujan and Council President Flynn, um, who attended and participated this hearing. I want to thank the advocates from Action for Equity, the Chinatown Community Land Trust, City Life Vida Urbana, and various other advocacy groups who came and shared um, for the need for anti-displacement zones, specifically around the Fairmont Corridor um, in East Boston and an overlay that would protect row houses in Chinatown. Uh, thank you for the members of the administration who also explained to us the benefits of revisiting Article 91, but also uh, some of the difficulties and challenges to using zoning versus an ordinance uh, and what we could use the zoning code for and what we should consider um, making policy changes. 
Um, ultimately, we asked the administration if there, what the administration shared with us is that any aspect of the zoning code can be appealed versus using an ordinance. And so we had a, some technical conversation about where Article 91 would go, but Article 91 ultimately aims to create a special overlay district in transit corridors that would help and support us in slowing down displacement in these neighborhoods. What we see in the city of Boston is that whenever there is any kind of expansion um, of transit accessibility in a neighborhood, it significantly increases displacement. And so a transit, um, a transit oriented overlay would ultimately set protections for that neighborhood, but also would create an influx of services and other economic supports that would help keep people um, in their neighborhoods and in their homes. Community advocates really stress the time sensitivity of creating special protection zones. Um, and again, the main areas that we discussed were the Fairmont Corridor, which is seeing major changes due to the investments by the state in public transit there, um, and also the Chinatown Row Houses and in East Boston. And also Councilor Braden shared about how Alston Brighton could benefit um, from this overlay. Um, I want to give um, time, President Flynn, if you can, to Councilor Coletta to share a little bit on this, but I would like ask that this docket stay in committee so that we can move towards legislative changes in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. <coughs> Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, President Flynn. I want to thank uh, the maker and my co-sponsor, Council Lara, for, uh, for her work. Uh, in this, it was an incredibly informative hearing, and I, um, I, I'm going to use the words of Lydia Lowe, who said it's never too late to keep fighting. East Boston, I used the term uh, yesterday, has been decimated by uh, displacement due to gentrification. And so we really see this as an opportunity to plan for the inclusion of folks along transit corridors and to help them um, grow their economic prosperity um, as we do that. And so I see, I, everybody that knows me knows that I love zoning. Uh, I'm, I'm a zoning nerd, I, I guess I'll say on the floor. And I really see this as, again, an opportunity to protect folks um, from being displaced um, and protecting East Boston, the Fairmont Corridor, uh, Chinatown, as well as Alston Brighton. So I look forward to future conversations, maybe working this into our, um, into our code through an ordinance, seeing that you can appeal, and as we heard through the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, hearing, you can appeal the zoning code. So I need to un understand and make sure that if we do have these special protection zones, we're not going to have individual developers coming in and trying to appeal it at the ZBA. So again, I look forward to those future conversations, and I want to thank all the advocates and my colleagues for joining us in that conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clara. Docket 1327 will remain in committee. Mr. Kirk, will you re read um, docket 1240, please? Docket number 1240, order for a hearing on Green, Green New Deal for Boston Public School Plans. This is specifically the plan to merge six schools into three and split each of them onto two campuses. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia, the chair of the Committee on Education. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And earlier, I wanted to have one more comment um, in regards to the Reparations Task Force to thank my colleague, Councilor Arroyo. Um, we spent many nights and weekends going back and forth with the administration, and your hard work um, is deeply appreciated. But it, with my nerves, I forgot to uplift you, and I wanted to acknowledge you publicly. It was not an easy fight, but you stood alongside us to make it happen, so thank you. Um, so this, uh, the Committee on Education had a hearing yesterday, uh, December the 13th, 2022, at 3 p.m. on docket 1240, in order for a hearing on the Green New Deal for Boston um, Public Schools plan, specifically the plan to merge six schools into three and split, and split each of them onto two campuses. Um, this matter w was sponsored by myself and Councilor Lara. Um, panel one con um, consisted of parents, grandparents of BPS uh, students and advocates. As always, you know, I like to lead with the people first, so I um, was really excited to have Megan Wolf, who's a member of QUEST, um, which stands for Quality Education for Every Student, Ruby Reyes, who's the director of Beja. Edith Bazil was unable to participate, 
but was definitely, her voice was uh, heard. Um, Allison Friedman, who's a member of the School Parent Council at the Sumner Elementary, Brenda Ramsey, a parent leader at the Shaw Elementary School, and John Mudd, a board member of the Boston Network for Black Student Achievement. We discussed and sh they, who discussed and shared a commitment to equity and belief that all students should have access to high quality facilities. Um, we also discussed um, the Green New Deal Coalition, which was made up of parents, educators, and community groups working together since 2018 regarding um, facility decisions and BPS. Testimony was taken from administration um, panel, including uh, Rebecca uh, Granger, who is the new uh, senior advisor for youth and schools within the new um, Boston's Children's Cabinet for the mayor's office, and from BPS, we had Charles Granson, who's the Chief of Equity and Strategy Officer, Sam DePina, the Deputy of Superintendent of Operations, Miriam Ortiz, the Director of Community Engagement, Ethan um, Burns, Assistant Superintendent of Inclusion and Education. It is clear from yesterday's hearing that parents want authentic public analysis of the Green New Deal's impact overall and broken down. They want uh, authentic community engagement about the decisions, and they also uplifted the need to slow down the process and potentially even put a moratorium on school closures and major facility decisions until there is a major facilities plan. What I will say um, is one of the reasons why we called this hearing to order was um, because Barbara Fields, if those who don't know her, is a fierce advocate in the education space, reached out to our office and said, we need to get a better handle of how BPS is moving as it relates to um, the Green New Deal. And while I do appreciate the administration's attempt um, and the Boston Public School attempt to do real meaningful community engagement, having participated in a number of different forums, we still have a lot of work to do when we're talking about creating space for people to be heard. And so some of the recommendations that I have made is to get out of the Zoom room and to get out into spaces where we're asking people to show up and to actually go into the streets. We have people who are sitting in hair salons getting their hair done and barbershops and nail salons and laundry mats. There are spaces and places that are impacted by the decisions that we're making, but they're not being called into the space. So I'm asking BPS to get out of their comfort zone and into the streets so that we can make sure that all parents are participating in these processes and have a real way of engaging. I do look forward to uh, keeping this in committee and creating an, a space for, um, for the council to really lean into it. I also want to thank my colleagues who participated in the hearing, Councillor Louis Jen, Councillor Rorel, Councillor Braden, and Councillor Kenzie Bach, and Councillor Flynn. Um, I also want to note that my colleague and co-sponsor, Councillor Lada, was unable to join me, but was definitely there in spirit, fighting a cold, but I know that she is holding it down. Um, and really leaning into to this work. And I just want to quickly just apologize because yesterday was my daughter's mock trial at Moakley Court and I needed to be out of here exactly at five. So I was keeping everybody on task and do appreciate your grace for allowing me to sit through the process. But I'm just really grateful um, that we had an opportunity to hold space and create um, an opportunity for BPS to see us as partners, not just as people who want to just cause ruckus. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Docket 1240 will remain in committee. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Mr. Quirk, can you please read docket 1529, please? Docket number 1529, Councilor Coletta and Lara offer the following. Ordinance amending Chapter 6, Section 6-11 of the City of Boston Code Ordinances regarding gender inclusion. Thank you. The, ch the Chair recognizes Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, President Flynn. I'd like to suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor louis as a third co-sponsor. Hearing no objection, Councilor louis is added. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I love the fact that this is a restorative day uh, for many Boston residents. Uh, we're doing decades and even hundreds of years of harm. Um, and this amendment to the Gender and Inclusive Ordinance seeks to undo the harm created in this building. And it was first championed by then-Councilor, now-Mayor Michelle Wu, 
and Councillor Braden. So I wanted to um, thank Councillor Braden for her leadership on this, on this issue. Um, my amendment uh, to this ordinance is simple, but its codification will ensure we are truly fostering a welcoming and inclusive workplace for everybody in the city of Boston. In 2020, this body required that all city employees form, or city employment forms gave the opportunity for our trans siblings to self-identify, which was a huge jump in progress. Given this momentous change, as it currently stands, there is no opportunity for folks to choose preference over their chosen name in addition to providing their legal name, or as it's called in the trans community, their dead name. This results in an undignified process where a new city employee has to change their, their email address and go through a whole rigmarole to ensure that their chosen name is utilized and is in the directory of the city of Boston. Uh, it's a constant reminder that we as a city are not prioritizing the, their needs as we should be. And I was pleased in my conversations after I had brought this to the floor about two weeks ago, in my conversations with the Chief, uh, Chief of Equity, Chief uh, People Officer, I think I got her title right, apologies if I did not, uh, Chief of Information and the Director of the LGBTQ <coughs> Advancement Office, that they have identified this as an issue and have been working diligently behind the scenes to correct it. And I do appreciate their intentionality to get it right, to meet the needs of our trans colleagues, and to ensure our technology systems are equipped to take this on. This amendment simply codifies our obligation to truly be inclusive across all city departments, including in the council, and as Council Lara brought up to me uh, in BPS and other city departments. But again, uh, this is requiring us to be better in our code. And that means so much more to folks than you all will ever, ever know. And so I want to thank my North End liaison, Jack, who allowed me to tell his story, whom this amendment is named after, my chief of staff, Ellie Sanchez, for her work, and others who offered support immediately after I raised this as an issue about two weeks ago. And with that, uh, I'm going to respectfully request that my colleagues vote in the affirmative to suspend and pass this ordinance uh, through the body today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Acorda. Acorda. Um, the chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, Thank you, Councillor Coletta, for moving this forward. A couple of weeks ago, when Councillor Coletta spoke on the floor about the um, issues that her staffer was having um, in using their chosen name on the city council, I called Councillor Coletta immediately after the meeting because I was actively working on a constituent issue. Um, one of my constituents was an incoming BPS teacher and was being forced to use their dead name on the publicly, um, the publicly visible grading um, program that Boston Public Schools uses. Now, we were able to correct this issue through a lot of back and forth conversation, but what we found is that there was a necessity for real systemic change, but also for the city of Boston to be more prescriptive in the implementation of this policy. And so the change to this ordinance um, was born. I have little to add um, to Councillor Coletta's remarks. As Councillor Mejia uh, remarked, I am very much fighting a very strong flu, so I appreciate you all for being so gracious with me uh, as I stumbled through this meeting, but I think that this is just getting us one step closer to ensuring that all of our people in the city of Boston, but also all of our workers here, um, feel like we are affirming their identities, whatever those identities may be. So I echo Councillor Coletta's request for all of my council colleagues to please vote in the affirmative and help us pass this amendment to this ordinance today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Laura. The chair recognizes Council Louis Jean. Council Louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I want to thank um, the lead sponsor and, and um, also co-sponsor um, Councilor Coletta and uh, Councilor Lada for um, including me on this. Um, language, as we know, is an important and, and can be a powerful driver of representation and what inclusion looks like in our city, or it can be a powerful driver of, of harm, um, harmful stereotypes and exclusion, depending on how we use it. Um, and so we should always be thinking as a city of how do we invite more people in, um, both if that's on our uh, legal forms and documents, it's, if that's um, you know, providing shelter, we should always be thinking about how, what we're doing to make Boston feel as welcoming as it should be to everyone. Um, the LGBTQ plus community continues to face marginalization and discrimination um, and violence, especially towards trans and, and uh, gender nonconforming uh, folks. 
Uh, we've seen that with Club Q in Colorado Springs. We saw the threats to Children's Hospital here, um, vandalism at the Pride in High Park. And so we have to speak with a clear and singular voice about what we will not tolerate and about the, 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 the lengths we will go to make everyone feel um, that this is a city that, that loves them and cares about them and that happens. We can do that here on the city council. Our research shows that gender inclusive pronouns and language reduces bias and promotes healthy and positive societal views. Um, we as a city have an obligation to ensure that language used on city forms doesn't discriminate by sex, uh, social gender or gender identity. Uh, we, we cannot perpetuate gender stereotypes, but rather we need to reflect the beautiful diversity of all the residents and families and all the people that we are so lucky to work with here um, on the city council. So this is a small but important update to our code that will help enshrine and codify um, those protections. So again, I thank the sponsor and I thank um, you know, everyone here on the city council who uh, hopefully will be uh, voting with us to suspend and pass. Thank you. Thank you, Council Louis-Jean. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez-Anderson. Councilor Fernandez-Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. Uh, thank you to the original sponsors on this, uh, Council Claire, Lara, and Louis-Jean. I, of course, uh, support uh, the offer put forth by the councilors, and anything that we can do to create a more gender-inclusive environment is something uh, that I will heartily support. Um, I think that just we're just outdated and life is a journey and to move forward and to grow and to evolve, we must be more inclusive. Um, I speak about my only um, parent uh, who was my 15-year-old uncle at the time. My mom left uh, West Africa at the age of three. And my uncle Luis, um, who I named my son after, was a closeted gay man and had to go through a whole lot of oppression and abuse and bullying, um, and then later moved to the Netherlands and then had to uh, go through that all over again systemically. Um, so eventually when he came out, I remember him having to explain that traveling country to country or um, just to be able to navigate systems um, in terms of not people not being inclusive. Um, I would cry with him on the phone for hours, understanding that this was something that I couldn't do anything about at the time. Uh, my uncle later got uh, killed by a drunk driver, and um, to this day, when I um, stand up and celebrate, I will do that courageously um, to fight for the LGBTQ AI plus community um, without any apologies, without any stereotypes or ignorances about what my religion or what my beliefs believes um, or stands for, that we should be tolerant and all inclusive and not um, primitive um, and not abusive towards others. Basically, who gives a crap? Like just, that wasn't a cuss for the record. In my book is not. Um, basically, mind your dang business and uh, let people live. Um, so I support you and I thank you for putting this forth. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to thank Councilor Coletta for bringing this ordinance amendment forward. Um, as an original co-sponsor with Mayor Wu, uh, Councilor Wu, as it was at the time, uh, I'm very happy to support this amendment. It's really, really critically important, and uh, it was an oversight in, in that previous ordinance that this issue was not addressed and, and uh, adequately uh, corrected at the time. So I'm very happy to support this, uh, this amendment to ensure that gender identity uh, is, is recognized and that we see our folks uh, in the trans community and uh, gen gender, uh, that this, this issue of gender identity is critically important and I really want to support you in this and uh, vote in the affirmative today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes <coughs> Council Bach. Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to echo my colleagues in thanking the sponsors and Council Braden for her prior work and. Um, just to say how important I think this is also as an example that the city can set to other employers um, and folks, you know, in, in Boston and beyond. I think it's one of those things that, like, this this kind of systems problem can be referred to as sort of, like, thoughtless and an oversight, but it has very, like, cruel um, impacts on people, and um, it's the kind of sort of undercutting of folks' identity that we should be um, 
avoiding stamping out it wherever we can. So I hope, I'm really glad we're going to do it today. I'm definitely planning to vote on the affirmative, but um, I also hope that it will be uh, taken as a model by other um, folks in the city and beyond. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Block. The Chair recognizes Council of Royal. Council of Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to begin by echoing uh, everyone's thanks to the sponsors uh, for this, uh, but also and most especially uh, to Jack for making sure that this was something that uh, I think many folks, uh, when they were presented with it, said this has to change like immediately, but wouldn't have been presented if not for his courage. And so uh, thank you uh, for that, uh, because I think that's incredibly important. And I hope that uh, when this change goes through, uh, generations of folks who work here in the council feel more inclusive and more um, part of this experience and have less uh, residual harms of things that um, hopefully we keep continuing to move forward uh, in, in knocking down things that uh, either intentionally or unintentionally cause harm. And so uh, I'm grateful to the sponsor and to uh, the inspiration for uh, this change. Uh, I also uh, want to make clear that as the chair of government ops, I support the suspension and passage of this today. I think normally this would come to uh, my committee and then we would have a working session and a hearing, but I think where this has already been uh, sort of uh, precedent has already been set through uh, the legislation that was pushed forward by Councillor Braden and others uh, in the past, I think this is something that should have likely been included in that original piece and I, I think it's appropriate to move forward with all due speed uh, today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Royal. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to um, the lead sponsors. I just want to rise to uh, also uh, chime in and, and support wholeheartedly. Um, you know, my little girl, when a few years ago, was trying to figure out if they, she, how to identify, um, and she taught me so much about how we show up in this world and how people don't see people in their full selves. Um, and was such a little strong advocate then, um, not just for herself, but for her peers, right? And um, as parents, you know, our kids are always looking to us to see how we show up in this world and how we validate or don't. And I, and I think these little small gestures mean so much to people who have gone for so long unseen and unheard. And so I just want to say thank you um, because these moments require political courage. And oftentimes people um, fall short of doing that. And so, so thank you for your leadership. Um, and I just wanted to rise and say um, I'm here for all of it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Council Coletta, Council Lara, Council Louis-Jean seek suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1529. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. M Mr. Quirk, could I revisit that ask if anyone wants to be an um, original, original sponsor? Um, I'm going to go back. If anyone would like to be a, a co-sponsor, please raise your hand. I apologize to my colleagues. Mr. Quirk, please add Council of Royo, Council of Bach, Council of Braden, Council of Fernandez Anderson, Council of Flaherty, Council of Mejia, Council of Murphy, Council of Rural, please add the chair. Thank you. Mr. Quirk, will you please read docket 1530, please? Docket number 1530, Council Lara offer the following. Petition for a special law relative to an act directing the City of Boston Police Department to waive the maximum requirement for admission into the Police Academy for Luigi Deadeco. Thank you, Mr. Kurek. The Chair recognizes Council Olara. Council Olara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I would like to suspend and pass this Home Rule petition. This Home Rule petition is similar to the others that we've passed here um, on the City Councilor, and it would help my constituent, Luigi Deriaco. Um, 
for your pronunciation. <laughs> Um, it would help him the ability to gain admission to the Boston Police Academy. Luigi is 44 years old um, and is just a few years older than the current allowed age to join the academy. Years ago, Luigi was enrolled in the academy but <coughs> suffered an injury that um, took a few years to recover from, thus missing the age eligibility. He is a lifelong resident of the city and currently is my constituent in West Roxbury. He's worked in his family construction business and has currently and for the past decade been a public safety officer at the Boston Public Health Commission, and so he currently is a City of Boston em employee. He is dedicated to duty, something that he picked up as a Naval Cadet in high school, and it's one of the primary drivers for him wanting to join the Police Academy. I wanna ask that my colleague that we suspend and pass this home position today so we can give him the opportunity to pursue his dream. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. Is anyone else hoping to speak on this matter? or add their name, please raise your hand. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, can you please add Council Arroyo, Council of Bach, Council of Braden, Council of Coletta, Council of Fernandez Anderson, Council of Flaherty, Council of Lujan, Council of Mejia, Council of Murphy, Council of Re all please add the chair. Council, Council of Law is seeking suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1530. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Truck, could you please read docket number 1531, please? Docket number 1531, Council of Flynn offered the following. Resolution recognizing the 35th anniversary of the creation of the Office of Immigrant Advancement. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Uh, Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, may I um, add Council Louis-Jean as the second, second original co-sponsor? Uh, seeing and hearing no objection, Councillor Louis-Jean is added as a co-sponsor. Councillor Flynn, please continue. Thank you, Council Braden. Council Braden, this is a resolution to celebrate and recognize the Office of Immigrant <coughs> Advancement. 35 years ago, this, this month, under, under the leadership of, of Mayor Raymond Flynn, the city of Boston's established its first immigrant rights unit to assist Boston immigrants. The office was launched on in, in 1987, provided health care, job training programs, educational resources, and legal services at no cost, aiming to help those who need support to navigate their lives, their new lives, and those who lived in fear due to their immigration status. This office has come a long way since 1987. Today, the Immigrant Rights Unit has expanded and it is now known as the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement. The office continues that same important work of assisting and strengthening the ability of immigrants and their family to fully and equitably participate in aspects of Boston's life. This is an exceptional office that does an exceptional work. And I know my colleagues over the, over the years have always advocated to this department during budget season to make sure that this office has the funds they need to do their job. So on behalf of my colleagues, I want to recognize the crucial work that these city employees, these dedicated city employees play, and to celebrate those who have been part of the creation and the continued success of this office. I hope we can adopt this resolution today, and I know there's a small celebration on Friday evening at, um, on the third floor of people are interested. I believe it's at 5 o'clock or 5.30. Um, thank you, Madam. Thank you, uh, Council Braden. Thank you, um, Council President Flynn. Uh, Council Louis-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Council, uh, Councilor Braden, and thank you, uh, uh, President, for adding me the, the 35th, uh, to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the Office of Immigrant Advancement. Um, it's a testament to the city, um, to uh, former Mayor Flynn and the immigrants who really helped found and advocate for the Immigrant Rights Unit. Um, 
or what we now know as Moya. We know that immigrants then, uh, just as now, are helping to build our city. We wouldn't have Boston without the rich diversity that our um, immigrant communities contribute to that. Moya has helped to boost um, the economic uh, capacity and the cultural vibrancy that makes Boston so strong. And really, we depend on Moya for the relations that they have with community-based organizations and ga grassroots organizations to really bring um, our immigrant communities that often live in fear uh, because of the stronghold that xenophobia has um, on our society. Uh, we really um, depend on Moya to, to help uh, bring um, our immigrant communities um, into the city. Um, and, and, and let them know that we welcome them. Today, Moya works tirelessly to help give opportunities for immigrants to learn English, grow their business, fight for status, and meaningfully participate in their community. Um, we've seen Moya participate in support of um, this week when um, the hearing uh, sponsored um, by Council Lada for uh, uh, restoring the rights of immigrants uh, with legal status to vote. Um, and we saw it last week when they were uh, on the hearing on uh, um, helping to support migrant communities. We know that Moya is really centered in the work and I just want to congratulate them um, in really doing so in light of, the, again, the rampant xenophobia that we often see, which is, is you know, during this season is especially difficult for me to digest uh, when we think about the holiday season and we think about for those who celebrate, you know, Christmas, um, thinking about Jesus' own plight as a refugee seeking shelter and, re shelter and refuge um, in Egypt with um, his parents. And so I just, uh, I'm looking forward to further support to further support the work of Moya um, during the budget season because they try to do so much for so many of our neighbors, and I'm proud of the work that they've done. I will be there with you, uh, Mr. President. Um, you know, on fr Friday evening when we celebrate uh, Immigrant Leads Boston, so that we can make sure that we are building more immigrant leaders in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lujan. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Oh. Oh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. I want to get you switched on here. Uh, Councillor uh, Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam. Um, thank you to uh, Council President Flynn um, and Council Lujan for for filing this. Um, I, as you may know, I or you, of course, you know, um, <laughs> I am a, an immigrant and lived uh, in the U.S. for 17 years without a green card. Um, I arrived at the age of 10 and uh, quickly learned how to obtain uh, whatever, I, whatever I obtained to get a job and uh, did that at the age of 13. And so um, I often try to, to, now I'm trying to um, limit how much I speak or what I get up to speak so we can save time. But then I realized um, I started getting some calls on this issue and emails and messages, hey, aren't you, weren't you formally undocumented? Why weren't you at the hearing? Why aren't you saying anything? Um, and I know that some of my council colleagues share the same experience, but I also get some mail, uh, go back to your country. You guys heard the message I played um, here in the chamber, um, a lot of xenophobia, but also, I'm not only um, the, the, the president, but I am a client. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I also am Muslim. Um, so I have subcategories and subcategories to my identity. Um, and, I, and I underestimate sometimes how much it means for people like myself who are sitting at home watching. So I stand up to say the first time that I got up here to speak Cape Verde and Creole, um, I didn't realize the impact that I would have until the staff from City Hall said to me, that is the first time I heard it, you brought me in tears. So um, I'm getting up to say it is highly traumatic to live in a country that you don't know, you don't know anyone, and you're trying to adapt. Um, you come from Africa, from severe poverty, and you get to this country, and you're a kid, but you're, you become sort of the caretaker of your family because your parents um, or your mom has, is, is a young teen mom who went through a lot. Um, and then you're afraid every single time. I got pulled over, I remember, um, and had to walk home with my then one-year-old in the middle of the snow because I didn't, because my license would check out, because my car got suspended and my, got taken away. Um, I remember so many stories like this that I can share that I know that people at home share and then a lot of people with their xenophobic views would say, well, what the heck are you doing in this country? Like, go back or um, we shouldn't be paying for those services. I didn't qualify for food stamps, for welfare, for housing, 
for any aid, for any services. I didn't ask for a handout. I didn't go to anybody to beg for anything. Um, not that I'm above that, that if I needed to, that God willing, I would have to do what I have to do. But I lived in this country for all those years as a kid, all the way growing up with no choice to be here, um, and did that and suffered. And yeah, you're, you're really fearful. You're driving in the middle of the cold and this hoopty to go to work so you can earn money to pay for, to take care of your kid. But then you're getting pulled over and you're afraid of immigration every hour of the day. Um, I just, I'm gonna shorten that and just say that I'm very thankful for the Office of Immigrant Advancement, but also looking forward to hopefully other resolutions. And I just want to appreciate you, Council Lujan, because I know that you've highly focused on immigrant issues here um, in, your, in, this, in your first term. Um, and I really appreciate that and looking forward to doing more work. Um, but I share my personal experience to say, um, hopefully for the people that are watching at home, I'm here, I experienced it, um, I remember you, I represent you, and I'll continue to fight for you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Fernandez anderson Councillor uh, Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just rise uh, uh, to thank the sponsors, and I too uh, always wonder how much oxygen I'm occupying in this space, but so I'm being mindful of um, that. But I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't stand up. You know, I talk about the fact that my mom was undocumented for a period of time. And I came to this country in the late 70s um, when I was told to go back to where I came from. And to grow up in a city like Boston, right, um, and then become the first person in my family to graduate high school and have my name on the ballot that my mom became a U.S. citizen and to be able to vote for me and what that meant for her after cleaning offices and being disrespected and disregarded and, and, and being afraid. Uh, I know what this means to be seen and to be supported in this country. And so with that, I just really am grateful for the work that the Office of Immigrant Advancement does day in and day out for, for our community. And I remember my first term, January the 15th, um, after filing a, a hearing order on safe sanctuary spaces, the hate that I received because I was standing up to support other people. And it brought me back to 20 something years ago when I was told to go back to where I came from. And it goes to show how much work we still need to do here in the city of Boston so that everyone, no matter what their status is, how they show up in this world, that everyone could be fully embraced. And I think that we still have a long way to go um, to do that work. Um, so we're here and we ain't going nowhere. And with that, that's why we need to continue to support immigrant advancement so that nobody gets left behind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor louis -Jean. I will also take the opportunity to say I am an immigrant from Northern Ireland. I, I have a very different experience from my colleague, Councillor uh, Anderson, uh, um, Fernandez Anderson. Um, I came here, I was hired to come over and work at Boston University Hospital, then became Boston Medical Center. Um, but in my journey, I've come across so many immigrants uh, in my work as a physical therapist in, in the city of Boston. And I have an incredible respect and appreciation for the work of the Office of Immigrant Advancement in the city. It is a very, very special place in our city government. Um, and I, it recognizes the immense contribution and potential of all of our uh, many immigrant communities here in the city. This Boston is an immigrant city. We are a city of immigrants. Um, and uh, I really want to thank and appreciate the, the work of the Office of Immigrant Advancement. And also to recognize the work of so many of our nonprofit partners that work with this, uh, the uh, Office of Immigrant Advancement, the um, English for New Bostonians, the Irish International Immigration Center, the uh, Brazilian Women's Center, the Brazilian Workers Center, all of, the, all of these groups that work uh, daily to help uh, ex welcome and get immigrants settled and support our immigrants in our city. So it's a, a mo a, an important moment to recognize that valuable work and commit ourselves to continuing to support uh, our work with immigrants. 
Um, is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? And is anyone else like to add their name? Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Bach, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Worrell, um, and please add my name. Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 531. Uh, All those in favour say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has been adopted. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please read docket uh, 1532, please. Docket number 1532, Council of Flynn offered the following. Resolution supporting renaming the McKinley Schools to the Melvin H. King South End Academy. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor <coughs> Flynn, you have the floor. Put your back on again. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council Braden. Council Braden, may I um, ask Permission for <coughs> Councillor Fernandez Anderson to be an original co sponsor? Uh, seeing no objection, Councillor Fernandez Anderson will be added. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, this is a resolution to support the proposal to rename the McKinley School, which is, which is in my district, um, from the McKinley School to the Melvin H. King South End Academy. There's a, there's a group of residents, there's a group of um, BPS students that are involved in, in, in supporting this as well. Um, Mel King of the South End is a historic fi figure in our city who greatly contributed to our city and to our country, to the South End, to, to Roxbury, um, in renaming the, the school in his honor would be an appropriate recognition for the, his tremendous work and um, leadership he's played in our city. He's a one-time finalist for mayor of Boston in 1983, but Mel King helped unite a city during very difficult times. He was a state legislator for the 9th Suffolk District. He was instrumental in the creation of 10th City which is, which is also in my, proud that it's in my district as well. It's a housing development that provides affordable housing to hundreds of residents. He is a lifelong resident of the South End neighborhood. And um, I know it's just right at the border of my, my district and Councilor Fernandez Anderson's district as well. Um, as I mentioned, he's a lifelong resident of the neighborhood. He founded the South End Technology Center where young people can find resources on technology, workforce development, community building. He's an educator. He's, a, he's an athlete. He's a, he's a coach. He taught at the uh, MIT School of uh, Urban Planning, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I'm proud to call Mel King a friend. Oftentimes, I would, I would go to his house early on a Sunday morning he would have he would have kind of an open open house and anyone that could would would want to stop by was able to he'd have breakfast for people and you'd sit around and listen to listen to Mel but also kind of exchange ideas with him and he invited everybody in and it was a great learning opportunity for me but I know other people in government as well he, had a, he has a wonderful wife as well um, in a family wonderful family. I hope we can adopt this resolution because Mel King is wholly deserving of having this recognition named after him. And I also think tonight the Boston School, School Committee is taking this up, maybe for a vote or maybe it's a, a week later, that I had the opportunity to testify last week before the School Committee in favor of this proposal. Um, and I'll probably have the opportunity to at least send a document to the School Committee letting them know that my colleagues are also on board. But I um, just want to thank Representative Mel King for helping bring Boston together, especially during very difficult racial times in the, the late 70s and into the 80s. And I'm proud of him, proud that he's a constituent, proud that he's a friend, and um, glad to partner with my, my colleague, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, on this recognition. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Uh, Councillor Fernandez-Anderson, you have the floor. 
Thank you, uh, Madam. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn, uh, for adding me as a co-sponsor. Uh, Mel King is a true treasure um, to Boston. He's now 84 years old, um, having been born in 1928. To put that in perspective, um, 1928 is the year before the Great Depression, uh, 13 years before US involvement with World War II, and about 19 years before Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball. Um, so along with all the accolades that uh, President Flynn has already mentioned, um, teaching at MIT or in ur uh, urban studies at MIT, um, founder of South End Technology, as well as uh, being the author of the book, South End Press, it, uh, 1981, Chains of Change. Uh, shortly after this, in 1983, King ran for mayor um, as a contestant to uh, then Mayor uh, Flynn and uh, Ray Flynn, uh, Council President's father. Um, though King would lose, uh, the two of them, uh, Ray, uh, Mayor Ray Flynn and uh, Mel King, then partnered and did a civil campaign, uh, which was a breath of fresh air uh, amidst all of the racial hostilities uh, that had arisen in the city after the busing crisis. Um, so we don't really have time to go on. And as we know, he was a state rep as well, uh, winning his election in 1973 all the way to and serving to 1982. Um, before running for mayor, as I described. Um, time does not allow me to recognize all of his accolades. I deeply um, love and respect uh, Mr. King and reiterate the support in renaming the McKinley School to uh, Mel King, or um, apologies, as uh, the Melvin H. King South End Academy. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Councillor fernandez Anderson. Councillor Bach, you have, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to um, add my support. Uh, the McKinley School is actually spread across three campuses, and though the one that people mainly know is the one in the South End, um, its students are also at two campuses in my district on Peterborough Street and on St. Mary's Street in Fenway. Um, so really uh, just wanted to uh, state my strong support for this. Um, Mel King, as has been said, really is a living legend of our city. Um, he's been so inspiring to so many. Um, I grew up hearing about him because uh, my grandfather did the legal work in partnership with him on Tent City. Um, and uh, just, you know, so he's been somebody who's been inspiring now to three generations of my family. So would love to see this uh, school called uh, the Melvin H. King South End Academy. Um, and, you know, we all had a great dedication of the square right near Yarmouth Street for um, uh, Mr. King a lot in this past year, um, and I think that's great, but I think he is a man who deserves many honors, um, and I also think that our school buildings are um, names that we use frequently and that uh, get passed down through the generations in our city, and so this would be a very fitting honor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, Mel King is sort of a giant to me, uh, someone who when I was growing up in the city of Boston, um, it was in rarefied air uh, in the ways in which he, he moved and maneuvered. And uh, as Councillor Box says, I think that there's uh, really a number of different ways he should be on. And I know he is on the wall of Madison Park, as he should be. Uh, he is uh, got a mural in the South End that love is the question and love is the answer, uh, which is uh, fitting for him. Uh, he has a number of things, and I, I stand in full support of him having this school named after him as well. Um, I'm going to share a couple things uh, before I give thanks to him again. One of them is uh, my my personal Mel King memory uh, that has always stuck with me uh, was the breakfast that uh, Council President Flynn uh, raised is, is an ongoing tradition uh, for him. And I remember being present at that uh, when I was about 13 years old. Uh, and while the adults were, were having this sort of meeting of the minds uh, around the table, I was going through his books. Uh, and he had a book there on Biko, uh, Steve Biko uh, from uh, South Africa, one of the famous freedom fighters there against apartheid. And I remember reading it, or starting to read it while they were having this meeting and asking him if I could borrow this book. And I remember him saying to me, uh, very sternly actually, he's a big man, tall man, uh, and so he, he kneels down and sort of lower to my face and he says, you know, I don't usually lend my books because they don't come back. 
Uh, and I said, oh, well, I understand. And he said, but because it's this book uh, and because it's you, I'm going to lend you this book. Uh, and so I took that book with me. And then I was 13, so I didn't have a way to get back to his home uh, independently. And so I had this book for years. I had it for over a decade. And I, wouldn't, I would carry it with me everywhere I went and my, my stack of books because I remembered him telling me that they wouldn't come back. And I'm happy to report that I gave that book back 13 years later. Uh, and so at least one of his books made it back home. Uh, but uh, he is a giant. Uh, he's a giant in ideas and compassion and leadership. Uh, and I would be amiss if I didn't mention the ways in which he has his own coaching tree, his own sort of roots that he has put forth in the city that have led to uh, leadership from folks like uh, former mayor and former counselor Kim Janey, uh, Carolyn Crockett, Nika Legardo. Uh, and I was just naming a few folks uh, who have learned and absorbed his way of being and his way of leadership. And I think they should be brought into this space because his impact has transcended even his own work, uh, but into the work of others and how folks move through these spaces, uh, including myself. And so I'm grateful to him. I'm grateful to uh, this uh, action. And I'm glad that we are doing this uh, while he can be here for it. Uh, I think often we name things after people pass on. And I've always hated that tradition because folks should get those flowers and that appreciation and that recognition now uh, while well, they are here to appreciate it. And so I'm grateful that this process has not waited uh, for him to no longer be with us, but has actually moved forward while he is still here to see it. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful to his family as well, uh, who have given so much to the city, including Mel and his time to us uh, as a community. And I know the impact that that can have on folks. And I know that they have uh, done very well to understand that he's not just their father and a treasure to them, but a treasure to the community uh, and have done as much as they can uh, to share him with us. Uh, and I, I thank them greatly for their sacrifice. And I'm glad that this building and these murals and whatever other ways we come up to honor him will last throughout time uh, for those family members and their descendants. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. Anyone else like to add their name? Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Fernandez, oh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor uh, Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louis Jean, Councillor Louis Jean, I'll come back, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, Councillor uh, Worrell, and, and uh, Councillor Brayton, please. Councillor Louis Jean, I'm sorry, I missed your signal. Thank you. Be quick. I rise, um, as Councillor Rory said, to just make sure that we're giving. Uh, Mel his flowers now. Um, it is incredibly important to recognize him for all the work that he has done and all the flowers we can give him he deserves. I grew up as a My Town kid under Carolyn, uh, which would not have been born without um, Mel King's um, really focus on how do we teach community history, how do we teach the history of people fighting for change. And so I am uh, grateful for the impact that Mel has had on my life um, through My Town and through um, all the ways that he is. Um, really helped to shape this city, uh, not just as an elected, but also starting off as an activist, uh, fighting for um, affordable housing and, and fighting for um, equitable schools uh, before, um, you know, before many folks were even talking about it. Um, I've had the opportunity to go to the brunches and invite my family. We've gone collectively, and I'm just grateful for him and his family. So absolutely, yes, to naming the school, the schools after him. Um, and anything else that can bear his name. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis Jean. Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and adopt adaptation of doc adoption of doc docket 1532. All those in favour say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. We're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1533, please? Docket number 1533, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Mejia. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1533. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1534, please? Docket number 1534, Councillor Flynn for Councillor Arroyo. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1534. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. 
Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1535, please? Docket number 1535, Council of Flint for Council O'Royal. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1535. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We're on to late files. I am, informed, I am informed by the clerk that there are four late file matters. The late file matters include two personnel orders and two appropriation orders from the mayor. The late file matters should be on everyone's desk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a minute, take a few seconds to make sure that they're there. Okay. We will take a vote to add these for late file, matter, late file matters into the agenda. All those in favor of adding the four late file matters into the agenda say aye. 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 Well, thank you. The late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, can you read the first late file matter into the record, which is a personnel order? Personnel order of uh, Council of Flynn on behalf of Councilor Fernandez Anderson. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. This late file matter has passed. Mr. Clerk, can you read the second late file matter into the record, which is also a personnel order? Personnel order by Council of Flynn for the Central Staff Office Manager. The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this second late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. This late file matter has passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read the third in fourth late file matters into the record, which are appropriation orders. Dear Council, as I transmit herewith for your approval in order to reduce the fiscal year 23 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $681,287 to provide funding for the Boston Public Libraries for the fiscal year 23 increases contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Public Library Professional Staff Association. I respectfully request your favorable action on this important matter. Dear Council, as I transmit herewith a supplemental appropriation order <clears throat> for the Boston Public Library for fiscal year 23 in the amount of $681,287 to cover the fiscal year 23 costs items contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Public Library Professional Staff Association. The terms of the contracts are October 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2023. The major provisions of the contracts include base wage increases of 2%, 1.5%, and 2% to be given in January of each fiscal year with, of the contract term. As originally presented to you, the fiscal year 23 budget request included a reserve for collective bargaining, bargaining, a separate appropriation to fund projected collective bargaining increases. A separate order has been filed to reduce the appropriation to support this supplemental request. I request, I respectfully request your support of this supplemental appropriation. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Council Block, the chair of the Committee on City Services, Innovation Technology. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I am going to be seeking suspension and passage of these two dockets today. Um, they obviously are just getting in now, so we did not have a chance to have a hearing on them. Um, but because they continue the long established pattern um, that we've been passing, and because, again, um, the folks have been waiting a long time on retro pay, would have to wait a whole other month. Um, I would love for us to move them today. It's 166 um, professional staff across our libraries all across the city. Um, again, the wage pattern is two, 1.5 and two. Um, it's, again, there's the $1,000 lump sum um, for, uh, in recognition of service during COVID-19. Um, there's a couple other sort of minor um, things. The Juneteenth, um, again, gets added to the uh, contract. Um, the <coughs> bereavement leave um, is now going to be provided to all members of the bargaining unit and not just those with the six months of continuous active service. Um, it clarifies that professional development funds can be used for approved um, professional conferences. Sick leave accrual distribution is reverting to being distributed each January 1st and July 1st. Um, the hiring process is being updated so that internal and external candidates are evaluated together. Um, there's one day of leave being provided for cancer screening. Um, and um, uh, 
and just clarification around the language of yearly quarry checks for the members. Those are a few like specific bargaining items. But again, the main thing is the pattern. Um, this is obviously the contract that's been negotiated um, at the table and um, would love to uh, have a support for a suspension and passage of both dockets today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Block. Council Block seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the third late file matter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The third late file matter has passed. <clears throat> Council Block seeks suspension of the rules and passage of the fourth late file matter. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The fourth late file matter has passed. We're on to green sheets. Any council wishing to remove something from the green sheets uh, may do so at this time. The chair recognizes Councillor Baker. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to pull docket 1411 on page 14 of the green sheets. Mr. Clerk, can you please read? Actually, Mr. Clerk, can you um, poll the committee to ensure 1411 is properly before the committee? Page 14. The Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Brayton. Yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. And Councilor Flaherty. Document number 1411, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $360,000 in the form of a grant three years of salary for the BTD staff position that is needed to implement transportation and infrastructure improvements associated with the BPDA plans, awarded by the Boston Redevelopment Authority to be administered by the Transportation Department. The grant will fund the Boston Planning and Development Agency Memorandum of Agreement. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. On November 3rd, 2021, the Boston Planning and Development Agency and the Boston Transportation Department entered into a memorandum of agreement with the, with, that the BPDA would fund a staffing position with BTD to assist in the implementation of the transportation plans developed by the BPDA. These plans include, but are not limited to, the Alston Brighton Mobility Plan, Plan East Boston, Plan Mattapan, Plan Nubian, the plan Dorchester Avenue Transportation Plan and Plan Governor's Glover's Corner. The Boston Transportation Department has a job description ready to post and needs authorization from this body to proceed with the hiring uh, for the, this important role. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you, Council Baker. Council, Council Baker moves for passage of docket 1411. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1411 has passed. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm looking to pull docket. Uh, 0866 from page 18 of the green, sh green sheets. Docket number 0866, message not authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $75,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 local consumer program awarded by the Mass Attorney General to be administered by Consumer Affairs and Licensing. The grant will fund staff costs and operational expenses. Mr. Clerk, can you also poll the committee to make sure this is properly before the body? The Committee on Small Business and Professional Licensure. Councillor Worrell. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Lara, and Councilor Arroyo. Yes. 
this docket is properly before the body. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. And this is a $75,000 grant that's awarded um, by our Attorney General. Um, and this grant will help us fund costs for uh, operation, operational costs, uh, which is for Consumers Affairs and an outreach coordinator who monitors businesses to, to deter unfair and deceptive businesses practices um, and to help ensure consumers are adequately protected and can get appropriate um, assistance. So I recommend that this ought to pass. Thank you, Council Worrell. Council Worrell moves to pass at docket 0866. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0866 has passed. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. On page uh, 16 of 19, docket 0921. Docket number 0921. Message in order for your review. The, sur the surveillance use policies from each city department or agency subject to the ordinance on surveillance oversight in information sharing, Boston City Code Section 16-63, the ordinance. Mr. Clerk, can you please poll the committee to, to ensure it's properly before the body? The Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice, Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Lara. Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. And Councilor Braden. Yes. Properly. Docket 0921 is properly before the body. The chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Docket 0921 uh, is an ordinance that seeks to provide uh, transparency and oversight of the acquisition and use of surveillance data and technology by the City of Boston. All stakeholders were brought to the table, including the appropriate city agencies and community advocates, and all worked together on this ordinance. Um, as you all know, and I trust you've read, it's 800 pages in length. Uh, not everyone is uh, is uh, completely happy. Uh, there was some give and there was some take, there was some compromise. But with my experience, uh, that uh, tends to, to mean that it's good legislation. Uh, that said, it's a case of first impression. It's a 60 day order that this body had extended, so we've got time constraints before we take action. Uh, and uh, it's also an opportunity, a stepping off point, uh, where we'll find uh, opportunities uh, to adjust and or amend if necessary in the future. Uh, the ordinance further uh, furthers the protection of privacy, civil rights, and racial and immigrant justice, while uh, allowing for the delivery of city services, particularly public safety. And at this time, as chair, moving for passage of docket 0921. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty moves to passage of docket 0921. All those in favor say aye. 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 I'm Okay. The, the chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council. Uh, Councilor Ball Catterlight first. Okay. Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Oh, you want me to go before no. Councilor Ball? Okay. Thank you. I didn't see that slide. Sorry, Councilor. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I, I just want to, uh, for the record, be really clear that. Um, my vote is not an endorsement of said report. Uh, during the redistricting process, we occupied a lot of time and energy, so I have not had a chance to dive into it. Um, and I do believe we have an opportunity to really dive a little bit deeper um, in, in the new legislative cycle. So while I um, appreciate it being brought up for a vote today, want to just make note for the record that uh, my vote um, is not a reflection of my endorsement or, or passage in support of it. So I just want it to be really clear that we have a lot of work to do, particularly in the government uh, transparency and accountability piece of the work. So looking forward to next year and um, advocating strongly that we have a series of public hearings so that we can do a deeper dive. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair on, on docket 0921. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, Council Block, did you want to go first? Uh, thank you, Council President. Uh, 
so I just I do I also want to go on record. I think it's extremely important that we outline um, the issues here. Um, technology such as Shop Spotter have been shown to be notoriously ineffective with inaccuracy rates of around 70 percent. Sounds like firecrackers and car uh, backfiring are likely to set the technology off, creating a diversion of public safety officers where they are needed, aren't needed. Um, this is costly and ineffective technology. I believe we can assume that the technology is not evenly distributed across our communities, hence likely acting as a dragnet by which predominantly black and brown and working class people are surveilled. Um, unnecessarily enforced into interactions with police that do not stem from criminal behavior, as demonstrated by the inaccuracy rates of the technology. Law enforcement has not reported much in the way of this technology, leaving us searching for additional information. As it stands, this is misuse of resources that could be going more and more worthwhile public safety measures. We are also still in the dark as to who can access shot spotter information and what specific locations the technology is being used. Um, they impact too many people in our communities uh, for such a tight-lipped approach from BPD. We need more data information and information regarding this matter before we can support its continued um, implementation and funding. Um, however, I understand that um, sort of we tend to, this tendency of doing things quickly because we don't have a board or the platform to be able to address this issue. Where most likely, at least I can speak for myself, um, supporting it because it's the lesser harm to do to move forward, but um, really would like to slow it down, um, honor the information we have, which shows inadequacy, inadequacy of this technology and continue the conversations before moving forward. Um, but today, it feels as though that um, we, or, or at least with conversations with community, um, that we will be in support in order for it to actually move forward uh, because we have it as is, but uh, would appreciate if we can take a look, um, seconding my council colleagues um, Mejia's point, to slow down the conversation and do this uh, better. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. So my, my, my board is a little screwed up here, so um, is anyone still looking to speak on 0921? Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Um, and I really want to thank Councilor Flaherty um, for his stewardship of this and also for moving this today. I do think it's important since we, the council, write legislation with various deadlines and then in this case we extended it that we sort of keep to the deadlines um, since we also try to hold the administration accountable to deadlines in our legislation. Um, but where I do want to echo colleagues is I, I feel as like we just sort of ran out of legislative time to dig into some of the bigger issues here. And, and to Councilor Flaherty's point about the 800 pages, I think you know it's also a, a weird sort of instance where because it's the first time the policy's gone in, we got, the council got all of the surveillance policies for all, all departments of the city filed at the same time, which made it really hard to work its way through. Um, but to me, there are some particular technologies. Councilor Fernandez Anderson mentioned one. Um, I and I certainly feel like drones raise a lot of questions about you know people in upper floor apartment buildings. You sort of assume your fourth, fifth floor window is private, and then you introduce a new technology and and sort of like how is that changing? Um, what's private? What's public? Um, so I think there's a number of um, technologies where we really should be holding hearings in the new year and digging in on them and thinking about. Um, are there appropriate further regulations we should be using? But I think that pushing that into the new year allows us to focus on those instead of just the entire mass of things that were filed this year. And I do just want to note for folks that in 1663.5, so the ordinance um, as written, it says that you know we're going to be getting annual surveillance reports, and then it says if the benefits um, do not out, like from, from the council's judgment don't outweigh the costs of the um, technology, it says the city council may recommend modifications to the surveillance use policy. We may also withdraw authorization for continued use of surveillance technology by majority of the vote of the city council and or request a report back from the mayor. Um, the ordinance also special specifies that nothing in this ordinance shall prohibit the city council from enacting a separate ordinance to ban or otherwise regulate any surveillance technology, whether previously approved or not. So those are sections D and E of 63.5. Um, in 16, and, and that just, I wanted to put that on the record just to say for anybody interested in these issues that, you know, the council approving today does not constrain us from taking that deeper dive on some of these things next year, and, and that's something that I definitely want to be part of, but I will be voting in support today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Buck. 
The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. I, um, I'm a little frustrated with this process, and I have been a little frustrated with this process because I think what would have been appropriate um, to do at this time would have been to give ourselves an extension and, and to Councillor Box point about wanting to stay true to our deadlines. I don't think that we stay true to deadlines at the effect of not doing our job. And I think that that's what's happening right now is that the council is not doing this job. We are not, um, not only are we not meeting this moment, we're not in compliance with this ordinance. Uh, we have not had proper hearings. We haven't reviewed um, all of the documents, but we're gonna pass this on today um, for all of the reasons that folks stated. Um, the ordinance does state that nothing in the ordinance prohibits the city council from, enacted, from enacting a separate ordinance or ban um, or to otherwise regulate any of the surveillance equipment. And so I just wanna go on the record to say that we have every intention of continuing to have hearings on every single one of these. We have this ordinance um, encompasses seven different departments and we only had one hearing that only the Boston Police Department showed up to. Um, community has not been involved. We haven't had enough um, public input and although I appreciate um, us being gracious with ourselves because of the limitations that we had during the redistricting pro process, I don't want us to pat ourselves in the back uh, because we have failed to really meet the moment and really um, what is the point of passing an ordinance and if we're ultimately not going to take the steps to make sure that we are holding all of the departments that are imp that are um, implementing all of these surveillance practices in our neighborhoods and with our constituents accountable to the processes. So again, I just want to state for the record that I have every intention of continuing to file hearing orders, to really scrutinize every single one of the departments and the processes that they are implementing. And it is my hope, and I will say this publicly, that the chair make um, every every accommodation to not only schedule these hearings, but that the administration um, also works with us to make sure that this is happening. We're gonna move this work forward. The vote today um, does not take it out of the council and I have every intention of continuing to scrutinize every single one of the practices that have been presented to us in these 800 pages. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Council Laura. The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, I rise to simply add my stance on the record as well. Uh, we're moving forward on this due to a timing issue as we've exhausted our uh, extension window. I'm also equally as, as frustrated, but I'm voting to move this forward with the proviso that we act on this quickly, hopefully within the first month or two months of 2023, and develop amendments uh, with ag advocacy groups like the ACLU. Um, so I'll, I'll echo my comments, uh, or my colleague's comment that this path causes the least amount of harm and I think it's our obligation to get this right, and I look forward to conversations in the first part of the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. The Chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, rise to echo the sentiments of my colleagues that we really did uh, run up into uh, a time issue here. I think the uh, least harm is to uh, do what we are doing today, which is the passage of it, uh, but the ordinance itself written into it gives us the ability uh, and uh, to me, uh, the responsibility to call some of these things back and to look at them and to see whether or not they serve this city and to have the power, uh, if we come to the determination that they do not serve this city or to the benefit of the city, uh, to revoke uh, these permissions uh, as on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think um, the appropriate thing here to do, we, as uh, Councillor Bach has raised, we received 800 pages of documents. Uh, this isn't simply uh, restricted to the surveillance by the Boston Police Department. There are other departments that also have different forms of surveillance, different forms of tracking uh, individuals. Uh, and I think it uh, behooves us to pass this document as it is today uh, with a understanding that in the next year, uh, some of these departments and some of these forms of surveillance or tracking will come before this council in a hearing uh, or multiple hearings so that we can dig into uh, the benefits uh, to those departments uh, as they see it uh, and to hear from community themselves about uh, their their level of awareness and understanding and how they feel uh, about those surveillance packages or surveillance equipment uh, and how that's being used uh, because I do think that the major issue that we come upon when we come to the use of surveillance technology is often they're many years ahead of where we are legislatively uh, and they're capable of all kinds of different surveillance uh, that we aren't necessarily aware of until they start to use it. Uh, as an example, 
uh, our cameras had the ability, cameras throughout the city had the ability to, through an app update, start using facial recognition. And unless uh, we are made aware of all of those things uh, in terms of what the technology is advancing and how it is advancing, what things are available, even if they're not being used, uh, at, like for instance, they weren't using that face uh, facial recognition uh, at that time, and they still aren't because we legislated it. But being made aware that they had the option to do that, I think pushed us to move that way. And so moving forward, I think we should have more hearings on this in the coming year to dig into very specific uh, forms of surveillance <coughs> and very specific surveillance programs and very specific versions of different departments and what they're doing. I think one hearing, frankly, wasn't enough, but I understand the time constraints and the way in which the chamber works as the chair of government office trying to get things scheduled as well. Uh, we have a two hearing a day rule and with uh, redistricting taking up much of that time and then trying to make sure everybody gets what they need to get done by the end of the legislative year. I understand the difficulty the chair had in scheduling. Uh, and so moving forward into the next year, I would hope we have a commitment to more hearings on this. Uh, but I will be voting yesterday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Royal. Um, I know Council Flaherty wants to respond, but well, let me give Council Louis Jean the opportunity to um, to weigh in. Council Louis Jean. Sorry, I thought my light was on. Um, thank you, um, President Flynn. I am deeply concerned about the erosion of just privacy generally in our society, and I think that this is an example of it. Um, there are some serious civil rights concerns here um, with the use and the expansion of these technologies civil rights and civil liberties concerns. Um, and we saw even just from the table of, content, uh, table of contents, which I mentioned at the hearing when we look at this list, it doesn't appear to be an exhaustive list of uh, departments, and, uh, departments and technologies for which we should have surveillance use policy. So I'm really concerned about that. Um, I'm concerned about the singularity of the hearing that we held and even in the you know, the lack of responses that we got from Boston Police Department about what it looks like for us to get, to have community meetings, to get community buy-in and not just talking, doing this work uh, and telling community what we're doing, but really working alongside community members for what these surveillance use policies should look like. So I just want to uh, put that on the record that I think that we should all be concerned uh, about government use of technologies that further erode our individual civil liberties and privacies, and um, that uh, it's important for us as a body to continue to hold hearings to uh, force transparency out of uh, the Boston Police Department and out of other city departments about how they're using technologies and whether we've okayed their use of these technologies, or whether we've okayed the use of city funds to pay for these technologies. Um, and so I'm committed to working alongside community members and stakeholders um, who are also interested in making sure that we are doing everything we can to protect the civil rights and civil liberties of our residents, um, especially for our black and brown communities, our immigrant communities. We know from research, from data, from court decisions how these technologies tend to be dispro disproportionately used against uh, communities that already have their back against the wall. And so I'm uh, looking forward to continued hearings on this. Um, and we'll be, you know, like everyone else has said, I understand the constraints that we've had, um, but the work doesn't stop here. And so I look forward to what we'll do in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Council Louis Jean. Um, before I call on Council Flaherty, I'm going to weigh in on this. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on, on doing it, but I had, I coordinated a meeting yesterday with some immigrant-owned businesses, business leaders, in my district and there have been some robberies in these immigrant owned businesses and these business owners are asking me as their district city councilor for more support for more services they're asking me for four cameras they're asking me for a spot charter it plays a critical role in our city they're asking me for more police presence um, so I just wanted to weigh in on that and let you know what some of my immigrant-owned businesses are reporting to me as their district, district city council. And let me also add the, certainly Council of Flaherty may have been up against a deadline, but I, I know if there was more time, Council of Flaherty would have had more meetings because there's not a more professional chair 
um, than Council of Flaherty, so I don't, I, I'm, I'm a little, I just want to acknowledge the, the important role Council of Flaherty has played. I, and I'll, I'll, I'll give Council of Flaherty the, um, the, final, the final comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And to obviously to, to, to clear up, um, make sure there's no misinformation and to uh, maybe address some of the aspersions coming my way as chair. Um, there were several dates, both hearing and working session dates that I had submitted to the parties. Uh, the advocates, frankly, uh, specifically the ACLU, requested, asked for further dates and further delay. So let's just, I'm gonna put it right on the table. Uh, people know me, they know how I run my, my, my committees. I don't toe drag, I don't slow dance, I don't care what the issue is. Based on my experience and how I treat you all as colleagues, uh, whoever is the sponsor or the author, uh, including the administration, I am more than accommodating. I submit dates, I try to find a way to get the hearing, to get the information, and so that will continue to be my practice despite uh, some of the aspersions that I'm sort of hearing subtly here. Um, for those that attended the hearing, uh, we did have an administration panel that did include the police department. We also had an advocate panel that included several folks, particularly also the ACLU. We had public testimony. Folks that showed up were allowed to testify. We also, in addition, I had requested, we have Zoom uh, testimony because we did hear from some advocates that weren't able to make it in here and I wanted to make sure we made every accommodation for them. I know that some of my colleagues were not able to attend. I know that some did review and watch the, the, uh, the video. Uh, I also know that the document is 800 pages. So through the chair, I'll challenge my colleagues, dive into it over the holidays, uh, get through those 800 pages. Once again, as chair, I will be more than accommodating to each of my colleagues, to the administration, to advocates, to Joe Blow on the street. That's, that's the council that I am as a citywide city council. So I, I do take exception. I do appreciate that some folks did sort of say that, hey, I tried my best. I always try my best. I haven't been in this business for 20 years for toe dragging and slow dancing and swerving. If that was me, if that's how I ran my committees, one, I probably wouldn't have the committee, and two, I wouldn't have been reelected so many times over the years. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to make sure that there's no misinformation leaving this chamber today and that there's no aspersions that this was a one-sided, lopsided hearing and that advocates weren't given the opportunity and the public was not given the opportunity and that I didn't, I wasn't responsive to advocates and I wasn't accommodating their schedule, not my schedule. I made my, I, I was bending over to try to make sure we had hearings. In fact, I didn't just send one date, one hearing date, because I knew how important it was. I knew how many different departments it involved. I knew how voluminous the documents were. I sent several dates. I said, we might need to have several hearings. I even, in addition to that, I sent working session dates. So just so that everyone's clear here, that's how I roll, that's how I ran this, this process. Yes, we're up against time constraints. This body got an extension, 100%. We were able to work within that. So we had two options today. Do nothing, which I would not have been advocating for and been proud of, and then it goes on to the task force, and then they'd get the decisions. If that's the case, people would say, hey, why do we even need a city council? Why don't we just elect task forces and let them do that? I didn't want that to happen. I didn't want our body to have to deal with that. And so I said, no, let's take this position today, knowing that it's a case of first impression, knowing that it's 800 pages, which I bet my house on it, two-thirds of this body haven't read, but I'm not going there. In addition to that, I know that we're gonna have questions. I know that technology is gonna advance. I know that this is a stepping off point, that each and every one of us have the ability to do a 17F and or call for hearing in the new year. Fully expect that to happen. Fully expect as chair to support those requests from my colleagues, like I always have over the last 20 years. Thank you, Mr. President. Merry Christmas to everybody. Happy holidays. Feliz Navidad. Wish you and your families all the best in this new season. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa. Thank Kwanzaa. Put them all in there. Thank you, Council Flaherty. We're going to we're going to vote on it. So Council Council of Flaherty is moving for passage of docket 0921. All all those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Mr. Clerk, can we um, have a roll call, please? Roll call vote on docket 0921. 
<clears throat> Council Arroyo. Yes. Council Arroyo, yes. Council Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta. Aye. Councilor Coletta, aye. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Lara. Councilor Lara, present. Councilor Lu Yes. Councilor Lu Zhen, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Worrell, yes. Majority in the front. Do you want to? Mr. Clerk, do you want to give um, Council Fernandez Anderson oh. an opportunity? Council of Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Yes. 12 in the affirmative, one present. Thank you. The docket is passed. We're still on, we're still on green sheets. Um, the chair recognizes Council of Fernandez Anderson. <coughs> Council of Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. President, for the lunch. I mean, for calling on to me. Um, I would like to pull docket 1344 on page uh, two, or actually, or the last page um, of the green sheets currently assigned for further action for uh, the second reading. Um, as a reminder, this docket is appropriate is for an appropriation in the amount of one million five hundred fifteen dollars to cover the cost of feasibility study and schematic uh, design work for boiler repair at the Jeremiah E. Burke High School window and door repair at the English High School, boiler repair at the Curly K-8 School, boiler repair at the Haley Elementary School, and roof repair at the Henderson Upper School. Um, we took our first vote on this docket October 19th, and I'm asking you now for the second vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Th thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Mr. Clark? We'll have to read the That's right. Record. So you'll read it into the record. And then I'll poll the committee. Docket number 1344 uh, from the Committee on Ways and Means, message in order authorizing the City of Boston for an appropriation in the amount of $1,515,000 uh, for the purpose of paying costs of feasibility study and schematic design work associated with roof, boiler, and window and door replacement projects at the following schools. The Jeremiah E. Burke High School, English High School, the Dr. William Henderson Upper School, the Dennis C. Haley Elementary School and the Curley K through 8 School. The Committee on uh, Ways and Means, Council Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Lu Yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. And Councilor Braden. Yes. Properly before the body. It's properly before the body. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Um, if you want to give a brief, brief highlight, and then we'll we'll take a vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just to reiterate, I'm asking for a second vote on the, the affirmative on docket 1344. Thank, thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson moves to take the second reading a vote on docket 13. 44. Mr. Clerk, can you please take a roll call vote on docket 1344, please? Docket number 1344, second reading. Do uh, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Bach. Aye. Councilor Bach, aye. Councilor Braden. Aye. Councilor Braden, aye. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Luzhen, yes. Council Luzhen, yes. Council Mejia, Council Murphy, yes. Council Murphy, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Council Worrell, yes. Twelve in the affirmative. It is passed. We're still on green sheets. If anyone has anything else, okay. We're on to the we're on to the consent agenda. Yeah, I've been informed by the clerk that there are two additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves to the adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted.
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, we're on to memorials. Several of my colleagues um, asked to speak about someone from their family or their, their community that has passed, especially during, during this holiday season. So I thought it was appropriate if, if people want to speak about a loved one or a community member that has passed during this time. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, read the names into the, into the record, and then I'm going to ask if anyone would like to speak on, on, on their um, loved one or their, their family member or their community member. The, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, just wondered if I can just make a quick announcement before that, um, just in the spirit of like not memorials, but um, just wanted to thank everyone here for their um, prayers. Um, my brother in law, those of you know that. Um, I made a boo-boo and hired my sister and did not hide it and told everybody that she's my sister. But anyway, during that time, my brother-in-law um, went into cardiac arrest and um, I asked you for your prayers. Then quickly, um, a month, a couple months later, he was on a list waiting for a heart. Um, they've now, um, he's gotten a heart transplant and um, is recovering nice and strong and just wanted to um, celebrate that and thank you so much and continue to keep him in his prayers to recovery. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Fernandez Innocent. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go through these memorials, and then I'm going to ask if anyone would like to speak on their on their loved one as well. For for Councilor Arroyo, Lisa Nazaro. For Councilor Coletta, Mimi Wren, Brian Higginbottom. For Councilors Flaherty and Flynn, Robert McCarthy, Joseph Hamilton. At this time, I want to call on Councilor Coletta. Councilor Coletta, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Council President Flynn, for allowing me to speak uh, on, uh, on my memorials. Um, and I rise today uh, in memoriam of these two individuals both sudden losses for their families and respective communities. So Marianne Mimi Wren was a pillar in Charlestown. She dedicated her entire life in service of her community and gave over 30 years to the BCYF site in Charlestown. She mentored and guided thousands of children in her time and saw every family that walked through the door as an extension of her own. Um, she was warm, welcoming, and just a bright light every single time I got a chance to speak to her. She was uh, an, an integral part in so many people's lives and literally helped raise thousands of kids in 02129. There is a huge hole in our hearts now that she has transitioned and my thoughts are with her entire family and the entire community of Charlestown during this difficult time. And the second individual who has left us far too soon, and I apologize. Um, he was a friend of mine from high school and a resident of High Park. His name is Brian Higginbottom and we belovedly called him Higgy his last name was really long. Um, but H Higgy was a rising star in the comedy space in Boston, and everyone who knew him would describe him as incredibly kind, genuine, and empathetic, um, ad adjectives that uh, one usually wouldn't associate with a comedian. Um, Higgy was just 30 years old. And I want to close this meeting to um, put a call to action in his memory, to provide better access to mental health resources, and encourage everyone to reach out to their friends and family to tell them that you love them and appreciate them, uh, especially during this holiday season. So again, my heart is with his entire family and the entire Hyde Park community at this time. And thank you again for allowing me to speak on this. It means a lot to me, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Clatter. And also, I, I want to acknowledge on behalf of Council Louis-Jean, Chekema, Waltawa, McLean. Would, would anyone else like to um, Speak. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, 
You have the floor. Um, sorry, Mr. President. This isn't in the spirit of moratoriums, but I felt uh, of, of memorials. But I felt like I would be remiss not to say because we've um, many of us have had opportunities to celebrate a lot of Christmas tree lightings all over the city in the last few weeks. Um, that in uh, on Sunday at 4 p.m., both on the Boston Common and on Copley Square, there will be a menorah lighting for the first night of Hanukkah. Um, and so I just wanted to say, because those are both, they're sort of my district um, and Councillor Flynn's district in Copley Square, but of course, like the Jewish community is throughout all of Boston and just wanted to make sure all colleagues were aware of that opportunity to gather with them as, um, as the Jewish Festival of Lights begins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bach. <clears throat> So a moment of silence for all those that were mentioned. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in those mentioned here. Before we adjourn today, we would also like to state that there is a lunch that you're cordially invited to right now in the curly room. And I also would like to Thank the clerks team, the wonderful clerks team, city council, central staff, my colleagues, and our staff as well. Um, the, the chair moves to adjourn today. Cine da. All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 The council is adjourned. <laughs>